coming to the second quarterly VIPAC meeting. Um, let's go through and get an official roll call so we can get that um, on the record. So my name is Emily Inouye. I work with the Agency of Agriculture and I'm the plant health team lead. I'm Judy Rosovsky. I'm the state plant regulatory official and the state entomologist, and I work with Emmy on the plant health team at um, VAAFM. Uh, Toby Alexander, state biologist and forester for NRCS in Vermont. Katie Kane, fish and wildlife biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Thank you, Matt. Oh, let's go with okay. humans first, right in here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Caitlin Cusack, Forester with the Vermont Land Trust. Uh, Steve Darnell, Director of the Public Health and Agricultural Resource Management Division for the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. There you go. Uh, ben Dillner, uh, State Survey Coordinator with the Plant Health Team for the Vermont Agency of Agriculture. Great. And? And Hazelrig, uh, Plant Diagnostic Clinic Plant Pathologist at University of Vermont. Grace? Uh, Grace Glynn, I'm a botanist. I've um, just started on Monday with the Department of Fish and Wildlife as the department botanist, and I'm out of Barrie. Awesome, welcome. Uh, Bonnie? Hi, I'm Bonnie Donahue. I'm the landscape architect for the Vermont Agency of Transportation. Steve? I'm Steve Mortillo. I'm the Natural Resources Program Lead for Marsh Billings Rockefeller National Historical Park and St. Gaudens National Historical Park. Catherine? Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Catherine Arroyan. I am with USDA, uh, the State Plant Health Director with Plant Protection and Quarantine. Mary Beth? Hi, Mary Beth Deller, botanist with the Green Mountain and Finger Lakes National Forest, and I apologize. I'm getting a message saying that my camera isn't accessible this morning. That's okay. We can hear you loud and clear. That's important. Okay, thing. Oh, and we have another person. Kim, want to introduce yourself? Hi. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kim Vermont Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation. Awesome. And Steph. Stephanie Smith with the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets, um, and I serve as Deputy Director with Public Health and Ag Resource Management. Did I miss anybody? No. Okay. I have put together an agenda, and I don't know if we're going to, if these times are anywhere near accurate. I have a feeling we may be just breezing through a lot of this stuff today, but you never know. But we're going to try to keep um, on track. So welcome again. And just to give you a map of the meeting, here's what we're looking at today. Our primary goal for today is to finally review those six PRAs that have um, been waiting for review and hopefully make a recommendation, um, whatever that ends up being, to the secretary. Um, we are also going to have an opportunity for a quick round robin where the different representatives uh, can have a chance to talk about uh, anything that they want to share about their organizations. Um, just want to say, Grace, don't feel like you have to. I know this is you, literally your first week at work, so no pressure. Um, just you can sit and listen. Um, that's totally fine. And uh, Steve is going to be covering a couple of Agency of Agriculture updates, specifically the new pesticide rule. We have had certain questions come up as they relate to um, the intersection with the pesticide rule and terrestrial invasive plants. So uh, Steve's going to touch on that. And we are also going to clarify just what the recommendation process is going to look like. Is it? I don't know if we're going to officially call it voting, but we're going to make sure that everybody's um, position is captured uh, for the recommendation. And uh, it would be nice to formally accept the operations guideline as a committee, just so that um, everybody has a chance to make any comments or change things. Um, and that way we can make sure we're all proceeding on the same page and with the same understanding about how we're operating. The announcements, we have a couple changes. Uh, some people have decided to leave because of, of good things. Um, Steve, who was here representing the VNLA last time, has switched over to working in the cannabis industry. He's excited, but 
uh, he did think that it would be a little misleading um, to be the VNLA representative and uh, we agreed. And so we are actively looking for a new represent representative for the nursery industry. Um, and I want to introduce two new members, Catherine Arroyan, you introduced yourself, um, but Catherine will be representing USDA APHIS PPQ on this committee, which is great. And uh, the ag team works very closely with Catherine on all the federal insect issues um, and pests, pests generally, a lot of insects. And Grace Glynn is uh, Bob Pop's successor. So welcome and congratulations. Um, so Fish and Wildlife is already all set with their representative. And um, finally, Elizabeth Spinney. Um, I have been, uh, she gave me consent to share this information, but she is moving on to a new position. She's uh, going into the nonprofit sector and will be writing grants. Uh, so she is stepping away. Kathy Decker was going to be in her place today, but wasn't able to make it. But Kathy is working on figuring out who the FPR replacement will be. So that is in the works. Um, but Elizabeth and Kathy wanted me to pass that along. So um, you get a chance and you know Elizabeth and you want to send her an email congratulating her. This isn't a bad move for her. So I'm excited for her. All right. Now, already five minutes ahead of schedule, um, <laughs> committee member updates. Um, this can be whatever you want. And if you don't have anything to share, it's totally fine. You can just say pass. Um, so this should, these people shouldn't feel like there's pressure. Um, except the first be person being called. Toby, would you mind talking about NRCS and anything that you might want to share about what's going on? Um, I guess no major, major updates. We, um, we do have a little more um, capability out in the field. We've fired three foresters um, in the north, central, and southern part of the state that are full time NRCS employees. Um, and they'll all be getting their. Can folks hear Toby okay? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Good. And they'll all be getting their pesticide applicators, um, place or certifications. Um, so they'll be doing a lot of the basic plant control plans and. Um, practice certifications, that sort of thing. Um, I believe we're, uh, we're we're in the contracting season and we're not done obligation for equipment. I think we're already at 400 plus thousand for invasive plant control alone this year. So um, yeah. it's it's as high, if not higher than typical, I think. And um, a lot of our money moving forward is going to be coming through Inflation Reduction Act for climate smart practices. And we've submitted um, for a recommendation from Vermont that brush management and herbaceous weed treatment, which are both used for invasive plant control in, the, in Vermont and, and elsewhere in the Northeast, um, that it be added to the climate smart practice um, list. Currently, there is forest and improvement and you know we don't typically do much forest and improvement without doing some invasive plant control and we think that there's enough information out there showing the you know how invasive plants inhibit growth of trees and, and take the place of trees that you know for carbon storage sequestration um, invasive plants do play a negative role in that process so we submitted that to be added to the climate smart list and we hope it'll be added for the future. So that's all I have. That's pretty well, great. That's lots. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Before we go to the next person, I just want to quickly introduce Krista, Krista Lessing. She's working with us uh, for the summer and is an invaluable teammate of ours. So just want to make sure that she's introduced. Yeah. Can I ask a question? So Toby, on the invasive plant control efforts that you make, do you put any kind of report together on you know what species you've been controlling where or anything like that kind of um, uh, the only the only report we put together really is for um, well we usually try to get something together for our uh, wildlife and forestry subcommittee technical committee to the state technical committee okay um, but we do report um, to this to the wetlands division when we're applying 
in wetlands or the regulated rivers. Right. right. Um, other than that, we don't. Yeah, I was just wondering some, some kind of, you know, way to track, you know, what you, you know, what you're finding, what you're controlling, trends, the areas treated, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, species wise, it's more, it's going to be anecdotal. Right. Right? All of our tracking is, is contractual. So it's going to be acreage and that sort of thing and money spent. But, um, you know, we, you know, we, we have field staff and partners across the state that, you know, have been around some for a pretty good long time. So they would be able to give any trends. But, but you don't have a report, any kind of, so you do report, you said, to the technical committee? It typically, well, it's, and like I said, it's typically, you know, the amount of acres treated and the amount of money we obligated to that. And we, we okay. create invasive plant control plans um, based Are on- Are those accessible on the web or do we have to request them? Uh, that would be a FOIA request because they're specific to landowners. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But that would have species. That would have species, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thanks. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you what. <laughs> yeah, I'm just curious. It's I mean, buckthorn, yeah. honeysuckle, yeah. Yeah, multiple rules. Yeah. Some autumn olive. Um, you know, <laughs> that's that's the bulk of of what we're doing. I would say. Then okay. there's not weed here and there. Okay. Where we think we can make a difference. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Barberry. <laughs> okay. Those yeah. All right. Five. I would say. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Toby. Katie. I have a question for Toby yeah. before I go. Um, <laughs> sorry. The brush management and herbaceous weed control, would that be added in subsequent years? Like that's not gonna come on deck right now. No, I mean the first that could be added to that climate smart activity list would be fiscal year 2024. Okay. Yeah. So next year, hopefully. Okay. Great. Um, I don't think I have any major updates for my discussion while life. Awesome. Yeah. Hi, sorry I'm late. Um, I don't know if I have any major updates, just the fact that my field season is starting. Water chestnut is growing in Lake Champlain um, pretty abundantly. Yeah. All the other aquatics are doing great. Um, I guess there is a moratorium, or not a moratorium, there's going to be a study for the use of Purcellicor, which is an aquatic herbicide. Uh, from the state legislature. Uh, so we will be um, completing a, a study starting in September on the efficacy and or drawbacks of using Priscilacor as the only aquatic oversight that we have right now that is uh, uh, available to use in the state of Vermont. So that is due to some miscommunication that went out in uh, Bomazine, like Bomazine's application for, for Priscilacor has been used by several lakes throughout the past few years, and we've never had any issues. Um, but because of this miscommunication that happened in Bomazine, there was a lot of um, pushback by the local community for the use of this herbicide. And that caused a bit of a stir. So the initial um, bill was for um, a moratorium to not use aquatic herbicides at all in the state. And fortunately, that did not pass. But what is left from that is the study. So I'll be involved in that. Yeah, Judy. What happened to sonar as an option? Sonar has kind of fallen off of the plate because Priscilacord is is more targeted towards specifically Eurasia water milfoil that most of these projects are used for. So it was more targeted than Sonar was? Yeah. That, yeah. Wow, great. Thanks. Has, has the, there was a committee established to do this review, right? The, right. Have they started meeting yet? No, it's supposed to be started in September. Oh, started September. So they haven't okay. designated any representative. Okay, okay, <clears throat> great, thank you. I'm sure yeah. somebody from Agency of Ag might be included in that study. Uh, yeah, well, there's no, there wasn't part of the appointment. I mean, there's no member, but we wanted okay. to track it, obviously. Yeah. Just whenever it starts. All right, great, thanks. Thanks, Kim. Catherine, go ahead. Thanks, I just had a housekeeping uh, request um, 
for those of us on camera, it's hard to discern who is speaking in the room. Um, and since I don't know most of you, um, if you could just say, hi, this is so and so before you ask your question, that would be very helpful for me. Fair enough. Um, Jim, this is Emily Catherine. Um, <laughs> uh, can you just give me uh, what, what is your assessment of the water chestnut situation in Lake Champlain? Like from your vantage point, what are we looking at long term? Oh, it's it's been a 40 year project. Um, actually, Meg is part of this as well. Meg Moldy just walked in the room. Um, so we just did a tour of the southern locations in Lake Champlain yesterday and it's there's mats down there so we do receive a federal uh, grant agreement with army corps of engineers to maintain the navigable waters in southern lake champlain and so you know th there's mats prolifically of water chestnut in the southern lake champlain region so they're just starting to surface and yeah there's it's been the project overall has been a success because we don't do mechanical harvesting in the northern portions of Lake Champlain. It's really Benson Landing South, um, so that's what we're trying to, you know, maintain that management operation is mechanical harvesting south of Benson Landing, and then hand pulling uh, targeted operations for hand pulling in the northern portion of Lake Champlain. So status quo. Yeah, so there's some sites where we're really we have had success, like there's been eradication in certain satellite locations, especially in the northern part of the lake. So we partner with Quebec and with New York and Kim does the lion's share of the work managing the money that comes from the Army Corps of Engineers because she's really managing mechanical harvesters and hand harvesters on both sides of the lake of New York and Vermont. But New York also brings to the table an additional mechanical harvester. Um, so it's a lot of coordination and then we're working with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on the Missisquoi National Wildlife Refuge where they have a population that they've been managing um, and they really need to do that on their own because of all the sensitive bird species that nest there. So they go in and they do a really great job mapping and reporting and doing all the good stuff. So I would say this is one of the hugest success stories for invasive species in Lake Champlain because those dense populations, meaning greater than 25% density where we use mechanical harvesters, has been moved from Crown Point all the way down to Benson. So the target is to eliminate mechanical harvesting. That's still going to be at least a decade, if not two out. This is because the seeds can be viable for 10 years. You have to go back and manage and manage and manage until you deplete the seed bank and you have then final success. A lot of work. Um, quick question. I know back when I did it 100 years ago, um, there were populations in Dead Creek or in some of those. Are those still there or have those been? Yeah, the populations in Dead Creek have decreased um, tremendously. There used to be seven major locations in Dead Creek, and now there's down to about four different locations. And the, the population has also dramatically decreased in Dead Creek. Some years we can't get to it. Last year we couldn't get to a lot of those portions because the waters were so low. I expect because of the water levels that I saw yesterday and where the plants are at as far as their growth form, that we'll be able to get into Dead Creek probably in two weeks. So uh, hopefully we'll get back in there. Thanks for at least those populations. Yeah. Any other questions for Kim? <coughs> All right, Caitlin. Yeah, I don't think I have any major updates either. Okay. Um, yeah, this is Caitlin um, and Toby. I did have a question is for the RCPP funding. Is there much of that going towards brush control or invasive plant control or? Mm, there's some, small? I don't think it's a major component. Um, I know there's definitely some. I don't think it's a major component though. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Good. Potentially. Yeah. All right. Meg, would you mind? Does, does okay. VLT require invasive plant control at all? On our easements, no. no. As we support landowners in that, but yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Meg, would you mind? Do you have any updates? I know you joined in with Kim. Other things, if you want. 
Sure. Hi, everyone. Meg Modley. I'm with the Lake Champlain Basin Program. Um, I'm the Aquatic and Basin Species Management Coordinator. I think, um, yes, a few updates. I, Kim, again, has been working on helping us survey the Connecticut River for hydrilla um, with New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. Um, the population of hydrilla is unique in the Connecticut River. It's a different clade or a different strain that doesn't have tubers. It's pretty concerning. The Army Corps is very involved. Um, but we are bringing, we, the Northeast Aquatic Nuisance Species Panel, which Kim is co-chairing currently, are bringing the National Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force um, to Connecticut in the fall. I guess it's still summer, fall. Um, yeah, so that, so that they can come and take a look at that population. And it's really pertinent because we don't have hydrilla in the state of Vermont, and we are intersecting hydrilla on watercraft coming from the Connecticut River. Um, we've removed hydrilla from uh, jet skis launching into Lake Champlain. Oh. Um, so it's real, and we really don't want it. Um, so I think that's, that's significant. And then um, the Lake Champlain Basin Program has received five years of infrastructure funding, and a portion of that funding is going to go to invasive species projects, aquatic invasive species projects. And so um, we're going to be collaborating with the Grant and Aid Program through Vermont to make sure those organizations and projects that are located within the Champlain drainage are aware of that funding source to help offset other costs that they might have. Um, and in addition to that, our steering committee approved the addition of an aquatic invasive species staff person for lakes and ponds, um, and that will be implemented for next year. So that's huge news. Well, that's to congratulations. Us. For three years. So we have three years of funding for another person uh, to work with him, which is, I think, greatly needed. Awesome. There's lots of other updates, but that's where we're full bore with Lake Champlain with um, boat launch stewardship, and we added another decontamination station, a high pressure hot water unit to wash off boats and trailers that will be added at Converse Bay. And we are seeing uh, the fish up in Spiny Water Flea are getting busy in the lake. So we're start we're removing those off of fishing lines and flushing them out of bilges and live wells and those things. So, yeah, busy. It's summer. Let's go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Any questions for Meg? No, that's amazing that you um, got and did all that. Yeah, we do. We do. We do things. <laughs> awesome. All right, Mary Beth, would you mind giving sure, us I an can, update if you have any? I I can share one thing. It, it mostly affects what happens on the national forest, but it's just good progress that I'd like to share. We've had a decision in place to control invasive species on the national forest since 2011. But we weren't very good with early detection, rapid response. Every project we took on, um, specialists had to review, and it just took time to get everyone's input and respond quickly. And we've recently finished the supplemental information report that allows us to do early detection and rapid response. So we're pretty excited about that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can I ask, did you have any particular target species, or are you just just have everything we have in place. The entire list that's on the uh, noxious weed rule, um, okay. plus several species that are on the watch list. So not one in particular, but that whole list. Great. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Any questions? Bonnie. Hi. Um, I do have one. We just hired someone in, I guess it's the maintenance uh, division, uh, maintenance section for um, who's going to, I guess that they're going to be a vegetation management person. And we haven't had someone like that for a while. So they're run, they'll run our pesticide program, but mm -hmm. also they'll be working on updating our best practices and hopefully getting into the weeds <laughs> um, to help us more. So I'm excited about that. Um, that's great. Do you know if they have any um, botany ID skills? I think they're, I don't know for certain, but I do know that they have like an, an environmental education or the, an environmental background. So I was really pleased by that component. <laughs> that doesn't really mean 
ID, but it does mean I think some, you know, some values were formed in their education. Great, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Go ahead, Steph. Uh, yeah, I have a question um, for uh, for Bonnie, just based on what you said. So this new individual is going to be updating your best management practices as re it relates to um, agency of transportation construction activities and the control of invasive plants. Is that an accurate? More for the maintenance of existing, um, for existing, like how we maintain roadsides and things like that. But uh, we do, we did emphasize that we want you know, to be working with construction and with design. So we're hoping that it's going to be, we'll be influencing each other. Cool. I, I think maybe, I might be speaking um, for Emily, but I'm sure Emily and Judy and Ben, maybe Krista know what I'm going to say next. <laughs> um, but we're interested actually in working with AOT in, in how they manage invasive species. So to the extent that we can continue this conversation at a later date, that would be great. <laughs> Thanks. Great. That sounds good. Thank you. Yep. I also wanted to add, this is Meg from the Lake Champlain Basin Program. Um, Bonnie, yeah, we, we also held um, a water craft inspection decontamination kind of summit meeting with uh, Vermont Fish and Wildlife um, and Vermont DEC and DG was able to come to the meeting. Um, and we just started talking about the long-term vision of how to really prevent landscape level spread of aquatic invasive plants and fish and other pathogens. And part of that is looking at the model in the Adirondacks where they place inspection stations with decontamination roadside at, um, you know, either rest stops or popular locations where there might be infrastructure. And so just planting that seed as much as I can with agency of transportation. It's a long view, but I'm in for the long haul. So um, just wanted to give that some air. Great. Great. That's good to hear. And this new person will be reporting to DG. So I don't know if that helps, but yeah. Yeah, thank you. Great. Any other questions for Bonnie? Okay, let's see. Steve, how about you? Steve Mortillo, I assume. Um, so I have a couple of quick updates and at a smaller scale because we don't operate on a statewide level, but um, we just wrapped all of our herbaceous uh, invasive species management and then we're transitioning into um, mechanical control of beach thickets utilizing the Vermont Youth Conservation Corps um, across 30 acres of marsh billings uh, that starts next week. Um, we'll roll into control of uh, black alder, uh, European alder, and um, uh, black swallowwort after that at both parks. And then this winter, we're going to be taking out um, a mature stand of Norway maple at St. Gaudens. Um, and that's been a five year process where we've targeted about 12 acres of thickets and now. We're at the point where there's no mature um, woody invasive species at that park um, or in the wetlands. So um, we've been working on that, utilizing the Vermont Youth Conservation Corps pro crews. Um, and that's pretty much it. That's the type of work we typically do. Um, yep. That's great. Thank that's all you. I've got. Awesome. Thanks. Wait, I had a quick question. You said you're working with beach, right? Indeed, yes. And are you familiar with beach leaf disease? Yes. OK, great. Yeah. So and then just, uh, you know, a little bit more context. So when we are planning these treatments, we have um, essentially like a forestry roundtable where we have typically like Tony D'Amato, Bob Cook from New Hampshire, um, our quantitative ecologists come out. We walk these sites and we talk about a number of different factors. Um, and then we've set up uh, about 40 microplots to manage or to monitor the response. And some of those are in uncut areas with the thought that, you know, um, if beech leaf disease comes through, you know, we'll also get an idea of um, what the impacts of that disease are, you know, compared to our treatment areas. Wow, that's great. 
I have a bit of a question. Yeah, Krista. Um, how would you describe the current state of those beach thickets? Are you seeing a lot of beach bark disease? Yes, yeah, beach bark disease is something. So at Marsh Billings, we have uh, 15 years of data from the Northeast Temperate Network. So that's, uh, you know, over 24 plots for 490 acres. And then we have an additional 156 silvicultural inventory monitoring plots. And so from that data, we've seen a, an increase in mortality in larger beach stems and and an also an increase in um, basal area from smaller beach stems. So essentially beach bark disease is um, increasing, if you will, and it's leading to a drop in regeneration biodiversity, right? And so the idea is that in tr with treating this beach, we hope to get um, a response in shade tolerant uh, tree species regeneration, but also in forest forbs. So we're trying to kind of safeguard that regeneration into the future um and i think that we're hoping that you know by doing this treatment even though beech leaf disease is coming through it'll give some of these stands that are struggling with re, uh, diverse regeneration uh, a head start can I ask a question? Well, what, what is the mechanical control are you just cutting the stems so there's two areas at the park. One is flush cutting, and that's really due to safety, right? So we've got a lot of trails um, and we need to do that because one, we do horse logging, so we can't have high stumps in every area of the park. Um, and two, if visitors, which are also on horseback, fall off in key areas, they could kind of get impaled on, on a high stump, right? But the other areas we're treating um, we're cutting below the first live branch. So that's kind of like the high stumping method. And it's about 50 50. So it's about uh, 17 acres is being high stumped, and about 15 acres is being um, flush cut. And there's micro plots in, in both of those equally. So, you know, we'll, we should be able to get an idea of, you know, how that responds. Have you done the high stump method before? We have not, um, and we worked with Bob Cook primarily on, you know, identifying that as a as a method. You know, he was saying there's some pretty promising literature. I think it's from Nyland um, about efficacy around that. So, you know, we've got some constraints. We've got a lot more constraints than your typical, I would say. Um, public land in terms of visitor use. We're also beholden to the cultural landscape and preserving that as a historical park. So we've got to kind of work within those parameters and we can't always employ the best method, but we're, we're, we're glad that we're able to do this in, in at least a subset of the area. You know, and hopefully this will be shared out to other national parks if, you know, a couple years down the, the road to see as you know, we're not the only ones dealing with beach thicketing and especially, you know, paired with higher deer browse pressure, it, it can really get out of control for, for some of the other parks in the region. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions for Steve? Okay. Hey, Anne, would you be willing to go next? Sure. Uh, I don't have many updates, just uh, it's summer. Uh, lots of diseases, pests, frost, you name it. Um, I was interested in uh, looking over the um, the plants we were going to review today because I just got a um, picture from a home owner, home gardener uh, that has this, um, I'm not sure if this is how you pronounce it, petasites, uh, petasites um, infestation in her yard. And it's, oh my God, it's crazy that stuff so i can see why it's on the invasive species list um yeah she's trying to figure out how to control it and of course they all want to be organic but i don't think there's any way to control this stuff organically anyway um that's all my updates it's nice to meet you Catherine. i think we've been uh, uh talking back and forth on some of the uh, aphis trapping so nice to see a face
All right, thanks, Anne. Catherine, do you have anything you want to share? Um, not particularly, but just to give you a little quick bio on myself so you guys um, know a little bit about my history uh, with plants. Um, so I have been with uh, APHIS with PPQ for the past 14 years, uh, primarily working on Asian longhorn beetle. Um, I also spend a lot of time on an incident management team where I am called to uh, situations where we have rapid response, such as a uh, spotted lantern fly or European cherry fruit fly, um, trying to set up survey and control programs on the ground. Um, for this position, I've only been in here since April, so uh, looking forward to hearing today's conversations and getting to know each of you um, so I can understand um, what's going on in Vermont a little bit better. Uh, I reside in Massachusetts, so I'll be keeping my ear to the ground to make sure that we protect our uh, Vermont border here. But um, thanks for inviting me to the committee. Thanks, Catherine. OK, and Grace, um, totally up to you. Would you mind kind of doing what Catherine did and just uh, giving us a feel of who you are? Yeah, sure. Um, I am. So I've been in Vermont for a while now and um, have been working as a consulting botanist here with an engineering firm um, and also serving on the Flora Advisory Group to the Endangered Species Committee um, for a couple years now. So you know, seeing through um, threatened and endangered species taking permits um, and which includes one recently um, aquatic and a rare aquatic plant um, sort of balancing conservation of that species and some milfoil control. So um, anyway, that's um, given me kind of a good background from the consulting side on um, rare plants in the state. And yeah, botanists don't know a lot about wildlife or um, invasive animal species, but um, I, I went to, I did my master's at the University of Vermont in the field naturalist program um, and then moved to Barrie recently. So um, really excited to, to enter this role. As you know, Bob Pop was here for a long time, I think 33 years, so. Um, He's been a great resource as I kind of transition in here. So it's great to meet you all. That's great. Thank you. All right, Ben, can you give us an update from the ag side of stuff in the nurseries? Sure, yeah. Well, our, our summer field season is uh, in full swing. Um, our federally funded surveys are, um, are really taken off. Uh, we have eight different routes around the state for our insect pest traps. Um, then also nursery inspections. Um, I guess speaking kind of for the nursery side of things, um, you know, obviously the late frost was a, a big issue. Uh, I'm not seeing, you know, any other major pests or disease issues. Um, and then, you know, we haven't encountered any uh, invasive plants being sold or, you know, listed noxious weeds being sold in any nurseries. So that that's a good thing. Um, this yeah, year. busy this, this year, yeah, and yeah, so we, far, yeah, so far. <laughs> um, yeah, but we're, we're just trying to provide tons of you know tons of outreach material, mostly for on the pest side of things. But we always, you know, we do get questions about noxious weeds, and we'll give copies of the noxious weed rule to to owners and anybody who who asks for it. So trying to get the word out. What you want to mention? SLM, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. OK, can I ask Ben a quick question? Oh, yeah, yeah actually, this is my yeah. amazing program. Um, I was just wondering, what did the inspections look like at the nursery? Like, how many are you able in the world of however many tree nurseries or group organizations are out there? Like, how frequently are you able to inspect them? Um, yeah, so most of them we're getting to once a year. Um, and so there's probably like, you know, five to seven hundred registered nurseries on our list. So we can't get to all those every year. We probably get to 120, uh, maybe 150 this year um, with Krista's help uh, of, of the, the major places that sell the bulk of plants. Um, because, that, you know, so, you know, any, any place that sells over $1,000 worth of plants, whether it's a, you know, box store, Walgreens or something, you know, has to be registered. Um, so, we, you know, we, we don't, 
we, we do we will get to those if we can. Um, but you know, obviously we can't quite get to all that number um, throughout the summer. But, yeah. Yeah, I was also, if you know, uh, this is Judy, um, wanted to add, um, not all of those stores sell plants year round. You know, we have a lot of like Walgreens, um, Kinney's that might sell chrysanthemums in the fall, but not have plants any other time. So we're also trying to sort of get a sense of, you know, how many of these are really ones that could be problematic for the pests of greatest concern. Right. And we also um, do have an ongoing delinquent nurseries uh, list where if we find a nursery or we hear about a nursery that doesn't have an active license, which they need, we do try to file a follow up. But obviously it's hard to go inspect and follow up on what we don't know. So um, feel free to give us a call if you have any tips or, or concerns about any um, landscaping or nursery um, place, and we can try to make sure that they're registered and good to go. Okay, and the Lake Champlain watershed, they have, there was a huge outcry for more native rootstock for tree restoration programs, and the Basin Program is writing award letters right now for $1.5 million to tree nurseries in the Lake Champlain watershed to give them boosts in infrastructure, staff, and capacity. So. Wow. Those will be public soon, but um, some will go to groups that you'll be familiar with and some are new starts. So great. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. Steph. Um, I'm looking for our annual report that I'm going to um, tag in the chat so that folks can see what we did last year. Um, and awesome. that that will represent potentially what we'll do and accomplish this year. So <laughs> thanks. Thank you, Stephanie. Question. Uh, this is Kim from Vermont DC. Uh, are any of those um, locations at Petco's or PetSmart's that typically come carry aquatic plants? I think it's a really good question. We have in the past, um, not currently so much, but that is a conversation we would love to have with the EC to make sure that there's not a gap there. If, if I, this is Judy, if I could speak to that. Um, so we have in our PPQ um, cohort, uh, Roy Karras actually has expertise in some um, aquatic life forms. And so um, in cases of concern, we can utilize him as a resource to go to these places, but he often goes to those just to check. So we have eyes on that industry. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, recently there was some um, aquatic animals that we wouldn't expect the agency of ag to take on, but is that the moss ball? Yes. No, that, well, well no. More recently, it's uh, crayfish and other uh, invasive fish that we yeah. found in Petco. Uh, so now I know that in the in the past that actually Emily used to go with Ann Bove and go to Petco stores and. Yeah. Aquatic aquarium places and kind of, you know, correspond with them to let them know that they can't be carrying these things. I think that's a good way of putting it. We co-responded at the time. Yeah. yeah. So do you have a formal inspection program or is it haphazard? Or it's hazard? more informal and it's, it's right now it's been geared towards um, not prevention, but action when we hear from other states that oh, have okay. invasives that have been identified in the stores. And so we've been reactive to those uh, identifi identification of those species. Um, but we'd love to kind of work together to, you know, create some more structure to that because there's not a formal structure or procedure. And, and it's worth having a conversation. We, I mean, the, the agency has people who go into those stores on a regular basis, not in our division, but there are other agency folks who go into those sorts for weights and measures and whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's worth having a conversation about it. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a future agenda item. Yeah, I think they're on our inspection list. Sometimes they register. Yeah, I think I think there's definitely a number of them that are that are, are registered in, as nurseries because they do sell like, you know, some yeah, aquarium plants and maybe even some 
random plants out front or something or like some of those places definitely are selling more than a thousand dollars worth yeah. of plants like 20 bucks well, i think that's a conversation we just had with the state. oh okay sure. Sure. just maybe emily do you want to put that on a sure to do list we we'll about that okay thank you yeah thank you okay did i miss anybody center of center the spreadsheet did everybody do any i think we're good Next topic, Steve Dwinell, director, is going to give us some updates, and I'm sure there might be questions too. Yeah, so I sent you a doc, two documents. Yes, we did. So why don't you put up the document on the rules, just okay. shared screen, probably the easiest thing to do. Yep. Um, <clears throat> this is the BIPAC associated rules. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, you know, just listening to everybody go around and talk about all the stuff they're doing. It's obvious that there's a lot going on, and this is a great forum for sharing information and you know, collaborations developing out of the conversation. Um, and but from the strictly speaking, from the agency's point of view, this committee has one job. And that's to recommend to the secretary to amend one rule. Okay, so that's what the committee needs to focus on. But like we talked about at the last meeting, we're we're happy as we can be to facilitate the conversations and getting everybody together. So we've got that set up for this afternoon. Um, so that once once the committee's formal work is done developing a recommendation to the secretary, then, you know, talk about whatever you want, you know, and see what, you know, share information, develop collaborations, but that's all outside the purview of the, the formal purview of the committee. Okay. The committee has one job, and we're going to try to do that today. So with that, I want to talk about the rules. Um, there are a couple of mentions of the committee, and there's one, one mention of the committee in the rule that we'll talk about, but if you could scroll down, Emily, to where the is that in focus? Or is it my eyes? Maybe it's my eyes. Anyway, so the the committee is a stat, uh, you know, formed in a rule, um, not just we rule, which says that the uh, that the committee means the Vermont Invasive Exotic Plant Advisory Committee appointed by the secretary. So that's what this committee is. Members have been appointed by the secretary, so it exists. And that the uh, committee, um, the secretary shall establish with with input from the committee the the, rule, the the list, and so that's what the committee exists for. And you can scroll back up to so in the recently adopted as of February 2023, the revised uh, rule for the control of pesticides. There's a mention of the committee in the section that establishes what's called a terrestrial invasive plant control permit, which is a very special permit for a very specific use. Uh, and and the, 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 the rule says that um, the plan that's used shall be uh, in accordance with recommendations provided by the committee. Since the committee's job is to establish the list, essentially what that means is that the permit has to follow the list that's in the rule. That's what it means. It doesn't mean that the committee will review the permit or comment on the permit. I individual, you know, you're always welcome. To, it's a public comment period. And you're always welcome to comment. Anybody's welcome to comment on the permit application. But just want to make sure everybody's clear that the, the, this does not establish a duty for the committee to review the permit. Okay, that's what I want to, you know, that's what that means. So if there's any questions about that, that's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah, that pretty much is. Um, for people, I don't know, um, does, do people have any questions about the new pesticide rule as you've seen it or understood it? Um, you've got the best person to answer the questions right here. This permit is for any and all projects? No, 
It's only, it was designed specifically for uh, townships primarily to, if they want to in, undergo, and there are a couple of townships that want to do this, under, you know, undertake an invasive plant control project in their township. So there really wasn't, right? So the way we have been doing that in the past is using what's called the right of way permit. But the right of way permit is specifically for maintenance of uh, traffic safety. And so it's kind of narrow. And just to make it really clear that you don't, you know, if you're a township, you want to control whatever, you don't have to get a right of way permit because a right of way permit triggers all kinds of other things. So, but you can get this permit. And I think we've got two applications now or something like that. If you, you can get this permit and to do that work um, in your public land, basically. So what happens, like we've had a couple of people say, well, I need, I think I need to get this permit because they want to control invasive species on their land. And no, this permit doesn't apply because if you have control of the land, you don't need this permit. You hire somebody, you know, to come in and control the control the invasive weeds. That's fine. You know, the person just has to be certified to do the work uh, to apply the pesticides. But you don't need this permit. This is a very carefully. It's a niche permit, basically, that won't be used very often. The way it's written, it looks like the towns could organize treatment on private lands as well as part of their effort. I think they, they still need to get the permission of the landowner. Right, it says it right there. That's why I'm right. asking. It says written land right. permission right. shall be required. Right, right, right. So, like, if you're doing a road, well, that may be right away, but yeah, if so you not, want to so, coordinate efforts. Yeah, I mean, it was if, if if for some reason the town wants to get rid of a plant in their township, they can use this permit to do it, and they go through the steps. For some of the agencies here working on private land, where we may not have technically legal control, but we have a contract or an agreement with the landowner. Yeah, that's fine. Just, yeah, it doesn't okay. apply. No, but that's you're you're doing everything as long as the contractor's certified and following the label and blah blah blah. Great. Yeah. The, so I did have someone just ask me about this, and no. I was like, from how I'm reading it, I don't think that no, that's you don't. Well, okay. You don't need that permit. Thank you. It's very specific. I also have a question about so in and I'm assuming that this doesn't apply to like your own state parks. They don't have to no. apply for permits. No. OK, great. The other question I had is so if it's not on the invasive species list, are they then not allowed to treat it? That's a really good question. Yeah. <laughs> I do not know the answer to that. Because yeah. that would be pretty crippling. I think if well, we I, well, yeah, that's a potential problem. Um, it, it depends on why they want to control it. If they want to control it for traffic safety, then they can get a right of way for it. Hmm. OK. But that brings up the point about the, you know, what's on the list and the process for adding things to the list. And the process for adding things to the list right now is through rulemaking, which can take a while. So that is a potential problem. And, you know, if, if it becomes an issue, then we have to figure out a way to deal with it. Is there a, is there a person that can potentially vet at the state uh, things that are not on the list and approve it? Um, well, I think what you're asking is, can we add can we add? Oh, maybe I maybe you're not asking this. Are you asking? Can we add? I'm maybe, asking for those like treatments that are outside of something that's listed, but we know it's a likely invasive species. Like the committee just hasn't d gone through the PRA process. Is there someone that could grant permission? Like a multiflora rose, I think, is a good example. We've been managing multiflora rose at the national park for a long time. If a landowner wanted to control or a town wanted to control multi-flora rose, but it wasn't on the list, would that just be an outright no for the use of chemicals on that species? And is there a way to kind of like allow them 
permission, noting that it's on the watch list. It's a likely invasive. Uh, well, the potentially could a landowner could always control, you know, on their own land. They can control a plant, any plant, as long as they're following the pesticide laws. Uh, the if a township wanted to control multi rows, they couldn't use this permit. They would have to use a right of way permit or have some other avenue. As far as I know, there's no way to just add or designate a plant as a noxious weed without going through the rulemaking. Now, like I like just said, if that's going to be an issue, you know, we'll have to, you know, I guess we can always, there's a potential for the secretary to issue some an emergency order, but that, you know, triggers its own problems. So um, we've had, you know, and actually, this is something we're having an internal discussion about right now, about how to how to deal with it because it is, you know, strictly speaking, it has to go through rulemaking, which can take a while. So, unless there's a legislative fix uh, somewhere down the road, that's what we have. Bonnie. Hi. Thanks. I was just curious if the right of way permit that you're mentioning is that. The one like an 1111 permit through VTRANS, or it does the agency of AG have their own right of way permit? We have our own right of way permit for pesticide applications, uh, for control of vegetation on right of ways. There's a permit process, and we have quite a few permits that we issue. I don't know the number off the top of my head, but it's a lot. Interesting. It's all on our website, all the permits that have been issued. Uh, yeah, B-Trans has one. Yes, that makes sense. Thank you. Any other questions for Steve while he's here? So Steve, this is Caitlin. Uh, uh, Steve, just wanted to make sure I understand. So this is a permit that's required if a town wants to apply a pesticide to control invasive exotics on land that's privately owned that the town has management rights to. So like yeah. the town forest, town land, they don't need any right. special permit. Right. This is just right. private. Okay. Right. Thanks. Yeah, if you have control of the land, you don't need a permit. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh, and, and if and, you know if any situation arises, you're not clear. Just ask us. We'll yeah. figure it out. You know. Anything else? Okay. Thank you very much, Steve. Sure. We are definitely ahead of schedule. <laughs> Our ten thirty point of conversation was going to be about um, just an overview about uh, the voting structure and actually Steve, um, would you mind just uh, yeah, going yeah. over some of that? Yeah, you got that other document. Yep. Sure. Um, there we go. And, and, and again, it's very simple. Um, we use this for some other advisory groups. Essentially, the function of the committee is to make a recommendation to the secretary. So, what that means is, in effect, the committee doesn't have any authority to establish anything by rule. It, it's just a recommendation. So when you have that kind of situation, you don't really need a formal vote, and you don't have to have you know uh, a vote that carries weight, if that makes any sense. What's important for the secretary is to hear all the opinions. Okay, and to get all the information. That's so this process is set up to allow that, which is, you know, when you have a plant risk assessment, that's what it's called, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Risk, yep. The committee discusses it and then you see who supports it. And if everyone supports it, great, done, yeah, you're you're done. If some members can't support it, then you go through a process to try to modify the PRA to see if you can get support, you know. If you you try that for as long as you want, um, 
and if you can't if you can't get consensus on it, then you just record all the opinions for the secretary to consider. You know, X number of agencies and representatives said they want to do it. Y said they didn't. Here's why. You know, as long as you record the reasons mm -hmm. for the secretary to consider them, that's, and then of course. You have to go through rulemaking, <laughs> so you have other opportunities for folks to comment on whatever it is you're commenting on. Uh, so there's plenty of opportunity for uh, input into the decision that it gets finally gets made. So, but, and this is just a simple process, just to allow those opinions to be gathered and presented to the secretary. So, yeah, pretty simple. Does anybody have any questions or comments about this? Bonnie. Hi, thank you. This is new to me, so and maybe we're going to cover this, but I was as I was reviewing the six documents, I was trying to figure out is there like a criteria that we should be comparing these two to make it like as a reason to support um, recommending it add being added to the list? And are there any this is sort of a two part question. There's that. And then what is the are there yes, any downsides yes. of of putting it on the list? So the PRAs um, and Kim might be a good person to talk to about this. Um, we the PRAs are you know they're structured so that they they are providing a certain list of information, and I think it's just whether or not you think from your perspective it's enough of an environmental hazard impact to vote for or against it. Um, I'm not quite sure how to answer what are we comparing it to. Well, again, going back to the rule, the rule establishes what the criteria are for inclusion in the noxious weed list. So if you go back to the rule, um, the noxious weed rule, parking number three, up here. Um, I'll just read what the criteria are. That would are. be great. Sorry yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, So it's, it's, it says the following condition shall be met for a plant or plant product to be designated as a class A or B noxious weed. Uh, number one, as determined by a pest risk assessment, a prohibited noxious weed must pose an actual or anticipated threat to substantial agricultural, forestry, or environmental interest and or the general public. Number two, prohibiting a specific noxious weed is likely to contribute to the objective of preventing introduction or for limiting the spread and or severity, severity of the noxious weeds impact to the same thing. Um, there is no substitute or alternative mitigating action that will accomplish the same pest prevention purpose. And the economic and environmental benefits of prohibiting a specified noxious weed outweigh the economic and or environmental benefits associated with not prohibiting. So pretty straightforward. Um, and then there's another set of criteria that says the following factors shall be used to evaluate whether a plant or plant product has satisfied the conditions and those are native origin of plant, no distribution, mechanism and potential for spread to and within Vermont, past current potential environmental, economic, and human health impacts, feasibility of control, regional and national perspective, designations of federal noxious weed, and or other pertinent factors. So basically, it's pretty wide open. You know? So it's, it's your judgment, essentially, um, as to what you designate based on all those factors that are in the rule. Um, and then you make a recommendation that goes to the secretary. And this is Judy. In the past, um, we used a form. We had a template that enabled people. All those criteria were assembled and put in sections, right, Kim? That um, the, somebody doing the reviews could fill out to ensure that we had similar information for each um, plant being reviewed. Yeah, so those, um, I guess, statements in the in the legislatures, uh, I'm sorry, the, the rulemaking, yeah. thank you, rulemaking, right. uh, outline what's in the pest risk assessments. This is Kim from Vermont, you see. And um, 
So in the pest risk assessments, all of those are noted as such. I will say that the, the form hasn't been updated in years and other state pest risk assessments do have a num numerical system which helps them grade and receive points. And so New York does that. I think uh, Maine, May, well, there's a few different states that have a numerical system. So uh, in the former ad hoc committee, we were working towards uh, adapting that form and, and revising that form to be a little more uh, stringent on, you know, a grade system. So right now it's a little subjective, I would think. Um, but uh, that's all I have to say about it. You know, the past risk assessments, again, you know, that's really the guiding factor and provides the information uh, based on those lawmaking statements. But that's where we're at. And I've noticed, you know, just I know that we're going to review these. Some of them have not been looked at for a number of years. And so that's we'll see what happens with the new pest risk, risk assessments and the conversation, the next conversation about how these will move forward. Great. Thank you, Kim. Catherine. Yep, I just had a question, Steve, on point number four, was it economic and or environmental benefits or both? Uh, control back up here. Uh, and slash or. Great, thank you. I'm not sure the, the existing form really captures the economic piece very well. I think it has a spot. Is it sold? Or is it sold, but not the extent or. Right, plus yeah. economic harm is kind of hard to estimate in many cases. Right, but if you, you know, if you capture some sort of, I don't know, I mean, there's got to be some record of some of these, I guess, but. I don't know, that would be hard to track down, but it's hard to determine the economic harm if we don't really know how widespread it's sold or anything. Right, but not all of these go through the nursery trade. You know. Um, yeah, I'm thinking more about some of the pervasious stuff that right. I'm less familiar with. But. Well, if you, if you don't know, you can just I mean, best you can. Right, and I mean economic harm, like as environmental harm that causes economic um, adverse economic effects to you know agriculture or landowners. Yeah, not yeah. uh, just to nursery owners. Right. So that just to clarify, so are we as part of this process? Are we asked to consider? The economic impact in the nursery industry of listing of these plants is that where you were getting at toby yeah yeah, yeah. it sounded like that in the cost of yeah that's clear control. that that's clear in the assessments that that information is at least presented but there isn't anything it seemed like in the assessment that really gets at what could the potential in economic impact to the nursery industry be of this type of plant listing i mean i think this highlights one of the issues with this list is there are plenty of plants that should be on here. So, you know, putting some of these on, the nurseries are not selling pedicides or most of these things that, you know, we're, we're adding to the list. So I think that is a whole nother discussion. Um, but, yeah. Yep. So if, if in the consideration of a, of a weed, or a, or excuse me, a plant to be put on the list, you don't know what the economic uh, benefit, you know, the economic cost is the industry. You can say that. You can just say, "Hey, we just don't know." I mean, sometimes you know? we do. Well, but if you do, you do. But if you don't, you don't have to. Know, you don't have to like hold it up right. so you do an economic mm -hmm. analysis. You can just, "Hey, we just don't know," because there's plenty of opportunities of rulemaking to figure all that out. You know, and if the nursery industry thinks it's that important, they'll have opportunities in the rulemaking to say, hey, you're going to put us all out of business if you do this, you know, and then that can be 
you know, so yeah, you don't have to, don't use that or don't let that stop you from making the decision. That's what I'm trying to say. Just seems important to be somewhat transparent at this point since we don't have a VNLA rep right. at the moment. Just to right. absolutely, yeah, them. and just say, hey, we don't know. Yeah, could could have an impact. We just don't know. Yeah. And and then that you know the secretary can figure that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think when people are developing the PRA, they can look at other states and what impacts they those states may may have had. Um, so it's due diligence upon the per the author of the pest risk assessment to really look at all the different factors and economic or and or environmental harm are one of those factors. Great. Any other comments? I have this is Katie. I have kind of a broad strokes question. Emily, if you just said there are plenty of plants that are worthy of being on this list and is there is there some sort of process for prioritizing? Like, are we most concerned with the species that nurseries might sell and invasives being distributed that way? Or I think that's really all really good questions. <laughs> and I think, you know, since the, the role of this committee is so focused on getting them, like we will have discussions outside of this committee, like, you know, amongst the different agencies and organizations around, we need to figure out how to prioritize these. And then also, who's going to do them? Um, I think that's that's the big question. But um, we do have another meeting, so I think that's where it would probably be best to talk about. Well, out. actually, you could talk about that in the future. Okay. You know, once you've got more through this list, you say, "What's next?" Okay. The committee can talk about it. Okay. And and you can use the same process for decision making mm -hmm. to do that. You know, an agency mm -hmm. or a representative can say, "I think we ought to do Plant X." Okay. And then everybody, you, the, the group supports it or doesn't, you know, and, and you know, somebody's going to have to volunteer to do the work. Uh, but anyway, you, yeah, you, you it, it makes complete sense for the committee to, once you've evaluated the ones you already got, to decide what to do next. And you can do that in the committee. For got sure. it. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is Judy. When we were looking at the rule the other day, um, I noticed that it, I'm not quite sure it's clear how a weed gets into consideration. I thought the language in the rule was ambiguous. Um, I don't know how other people feel about that. Well, you just have to meet the conditions of the rule. Right, but like, can, can the members of the public nominate sure. one? Can the committee? Whatever, the, it's the committee's discretion. You know, I mean, the committee exists to provide advice to the secretary so it's the, up to the committee to make recommendations mm -hmm. however you do that and you certainly have the expertise to do it so um well, we're gonna have a little bit of time so i think maybe we could dig into that a little bit but i'm assuming that people I and mean, people might want to be prepared to come with with a list or whatever but it might be an interesting conversation at least to see what's out there and what people are thinking all right um next thing right before a 15 minute break is um, if folks have had a chance to look over the operations guidelines for this committee, um, are there any real issues that people have? Anything that they'd like to change? And if people are okay with it, um, I would like to just make sure that everybody agrees that this is kind of formally accepted by the committee. So we're all starting um, in agreement about process. Was that sent in your email, Emily? Yeah, that should. Uh, uh, the operations guideline was the original. Um, would you like me to send that back out? Do you mind? Yeah. No, that's totally fine. Okay. Or either put it up on the screen if you could. Yep. Related documents 3, 3 um, 2023 20, at 4.08 p.m. I believe is the answer. <laughs> 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 I actually just want to find it. March 20th, 2023, 4.08 p.m. is when I received it. All right. Well, I'm going to share my screen. 
I do need to update um, some of the committee members with some of the moves around, um, but the names aren't there. So I just need to update the list or the organizations represented don't change. I have no idea how fast people want me to scroll without getting dizzy. I'll go really slowly. <laughs> so there's very little change since that. Yeah. Yep, it's uh, what we reviewed last time. So no, no changes in terms of how the process is captured in this document. Oh, there's the thumbs up. <laughs> so what Kim was talking about, does this allow us to look at that PRA document to adjust if needed? That's what I was just going to ask. That's a really good point because it doesn't really say anything about updating that form. Yeah. Or... So I think we should take a look at that. Yeah. 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 Sure. Absolutely. We'll do that. Yeah, because it basically just lists you know, what the PRA should include, um, but it doesn't really kind of get into how it is structured to to meet all of those yeah. rulemaking points. Yeah, and maybe, Steve, you were saying that we can discuss potential additions, but this may be good to have here clearly to us what we can do. And mm -hmm. then anything we can't then that's not in here but if there's some if there's anything else that we can do like yeah and maybe discuss sure. potential additions that should be added here as well mm -hmm. yeah. yeah i think that's all on the table for sure and once we get through the actual recommendation like voting on it some of these subsequent meetings will will have space to actually dig into these topics um because i'm assuming we won't be reviewing plans every single time necessarily yeah. Uh, just a suggestion. If you wanted to revise the PRA, you could appoint an ad hoc committee, subcommittee. You could work on it and bring it back rather than take the whole committee time to do it. But certainly, you know, subgroup could go work off offline and then bring it back to the whole committee. Mm -hmm. And that's can be an effective way to do a lot of things, just appoint a subcommittee to go off and do the work and bring it back. Yep, that makes sense. Does that need to be in here? I think, yeah. I mean, if yeah, that's, if that, yeah. yeah, if that is something that we're going to do, I think we can definitely include that. So just, um, just making clear that this committee is, it can review the PRA structure and how, like how it's designed, um, so that there is a consistent way for if there's a member of the public, we should have that available on the VIPAC webpage once that's developed, so anybody can have access to it. Um, and fill it out and submit it, and then we can review it um, that way. Um, so I think that's great. I will specify in this document then um, that this committee does have the purview for PRA um, forms and kind of the development of those um, along with, what was the other one, Toby, you mentioned? Well, just discussions of potential About additions species. Okay. to review. Yep. Okay, so... How about this? Let's not vote to formally accept this. I'm going to draft um, and insert those changes. I think those are really important. And then I will 
to the committee um, for review and just feel free to let me know what you think um, and add your edits to it directly. Does that work? Yeah, can I just ask so the public can fill out PRAs? That is what I, my understanding is that's not, you know, we, we would review it and see what, sure. how they filled it out. And obviously, I think it would be difficult for some members of the public to fill it out without certain backgrounds, but all of that presumably would show up in the quality of the PRA. Okay, um, that's fine. Yeah. I, I was just thinking of it more as a tool for the committee members to fill out and ask other expert, experts to fill out to help us make Right. Census. So what's the nomination process? Do the public have to fill out a PRA or can they just send a note and say, I really like this grant provided for these reasons? Just the committee thing, I guess. Yeah, I think in the past, the you know, it's, it was the ad hoc committee that completed the PRAs. Yeah. And then if there was public input into them, just whether from conversations or whatnot, then you know, people could have comment on, commented on them, but never filled out the PRAs. Okay. So that's a that's a conversation or a, a decision for the agency of ag of who is the designated authority to complete the PRAs. I would think it would be this committee because we are the experts and, you know, we're the guiding um, group that's making these decisions so right or in some cases it was other members like other botanists at heritage program or others at the nature conservancy or something that were affiliated indirectly with somebody in the committee so yeah so as a representatives from the committee members yeah too. Mm -hmm. yeah i Steph? think that would be helpful oh sorry sorry stephanie had her hand up Sure, go for it. Oh, I was just, and I, I didn't review this document closely, so I'm going to apologize straight up. Um, but the, I, I heard um, Steve Dwynell mention the potential of including ad hoc committees, and if that's not already in the procedures document, then maybe we would want to include that as well. Yes. I'm only familiar with the New York process, which their risk assessment is really for their internal experts, and the members of the public can submit species for review um, but you I, they also have a system where they can call on additional experts to come in and assist and fill out pras for consideration mm -hmm. um, which i think would be the purview of the committee if they needed more expertise yes. yeah. so what i'm hearing is would there be a preference to say the pras the filling out does lie with the experts but suggestions for addition uh, for pra development can be submitted by the public um, and then we as a committee can look at those suggestions and decide whether it is a priority for us based on the expertise available. Does that but, make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think that makes sense. I just wonder like the public is going to have a lot of information on distribution and maybe specific aspects of the PRA that would be great to for this committee. I assume what you proposed Emily wouldn't you know, preclude us from accepting input on specific parts of the PRAs from the public if folks had, you know, useful information to add to that. I guess it would be a question of how do we get the, how do we get that information, you know, asking, I guess asking our networks. Yeah, I mean, I think any information that we can get to ground through this is really helpful for a PRA. And if that's from the public, that's great. Well, I was wondering, actually, as a labor saving device, if we wanted to encourage members of the public to submit PRAs, because then we can just, with the understanding that this committee provides the final version, but that way, you know, any information they had, they would put in the format that is helpful to us and we could use. I guess I was thinking as long as they had, if we had some sort of format where they at least submitted some sort of compelling information and not just, you know, John. Pick a species and, and right. say we should do this, and like have something to back it up. I don't know about the full PRA. Well, maybe what we could do is on that BIPAC page, we could create a, a document just telling the public how we 
how they can submit a suggestion and just tell them the pertinent information that this committee would need to incorporate that into our discussion. Uh, so that's at least consistent and clear for everybody going in and they're like, okay, I need scientific name, the common name, why it's concerned, like just going over the basics, not the full PRA. Um, would that make sense? And I can send that out to the, the committee for review to make sure that it's capturing all the information that y'all would need to make that decision. Does that work? I think that works for me. I mean, I think that's a great idea to include the public. Sorry, Steve, I see you. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. All right, Steve. Um, that's Kim. Um, that, but I also don't want it to make a lot of work because I received tons of submissions of people who think they see aquatic plants that are invasive right. and they're not. <laughs> so, like, how how do we make sure that what they're actually looking at or knowing or seeing, and especially getting tons of um, cow, cow parsnip right now from people, yeah. they all think it's the other one. Um, sorry, I'm a little scattered this morning. Um, so, you know, I think that's dangerous a little bit. So maybe it could be just like a fillable form. And it has a few fields, and we can say yes or no quickly. <laughs> um, but I just would want to limit, like, how much work we're creating for ourselves by the public. And having clear criteria, like it has to be this is this. Yeah, but how? Sometimes the public thinks they know what they're looking at or seeing or whatever. And like it has to be on somebody else's noxious weed list, or it has to be a non-native plant. No. Yeah, I'm just. Maybe we can table it and talk about it further about what yeah. those things are, just yeah. so we can make sure that we're not receiving tons of recommendations. Definitely. Yeah. So we'll start. I'll, I'll start a draft, a working draft, and we can go from there. Um, Steve, sorry about that. Your hand must be getting tired. <laughs> yeah. oh, you're muted. We can't hear you, Steve. Yeah, no worries. Um, so getting back to what I was uh, I was going to ask. So the the National Park Service has a good amount of resources and a good amount of experts that we could potentially have help us in drafting some of these PRAs that would add additional capacity, I guess you will, to the. So I think the the issue is that, you know, this panel has a lot of experts, but not necessarily a lot of time. Um, and is that appropriate, you know, for for us to kind of delegate some of that to other individuals that that may be working as a part of our organizations? That would be amazing. <laughs> You're not going to get any passes on that. <laughs> amazing. I'm thinking. Steve, you had something? I was just going to say, I mean, there's no. Uh, unless you really want to get a whole bunch of public data, there's no requirement for you to solicit recommendations from the public. It's entirely up okay. To so you. that's not in the rules. So this okay. committee can make the decision to keep it in the committee and have the committee make the determination. Yeah. For them. You, know, you don't have to solicit input from the public on what. And we can just operate, and I, I'm sure there are members of the public who will let us know if there's something that they would like to, you know, for us to see um being talked about or considered so you know we can i guess deal with those as they come in but the committee has the discretion uh, discretion yeah does that work i mean i think there's value in it like caitlin said that there are people who are going to see things that we won't and we could always try some sort of form and then if we start getting buried under submissions then adjust it and and tighten things up on the criteria that we're looking for or have a screening process or something. Yeah. Yes, and, and I guess who's responsible for checking all of those? Emily. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll have to have a conversation about that too. <laughs> um, yeah, oh, it's a good conversation. So for now, where are we leaving it? The committee and then as the members of the public reach out and provide us with information or suggestion, we'll take it as it comes and bring it up and talk about it and then determine as a group. Um, 
And there is um, a member of the public who has joined us, Bernie. Um, and I just he he just sent me an email just suggesting the um, the iNaturalist. We had that conversation around like you know the issues with IP. Um, and I want to say that that is also the case for insects and whatever. So having a way to make sure that the identification is correct is critical. And iNaturalist does have photos, which is very helpful. So, okay, well, we will be filling out some things and setting drafts out for folks to look over then. Okay. <laughs> and now we have 15 minute break. Thank you. I'm going to take off my heart. Okay, It'll we'll be, be back right in 15 minutes for virtual folks. What I'm saying. Um, so that is going to be, let's meet here back at 1050. I'm not scheduled. Just remember oh, to we should all run outside. Emily, when you hey Emily, can you can you hear me? This is Mike Bald. Mike, we can hear yeah. you. Um, okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Hi, you're in. Um, we're just breaking. We're going to regroup at 1050 to start talking um, and discussing the PRAs. Right, I caught that. Um, I'm not I'm not sure that I can rejoin or not, but if I can, I will. OK, got it. And I have your points about the multi floor. I'll make sure we have to that discussion if you're not on. I have right. OK, thanks. All right, thanks, Mike. So do we need to offset yep. that? Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. we have a uh, conservation plan that we can't get that we can carry. Yeah. Uh, okay. So we'll be up in St. John's there in the morning. I know. So we'll for sure. OK. So I'll be back there. Kind of not. Just that. Uh,
suggestion for you. Yeah. Um, you guys, I, I have a do you want to? Oh, she's not going to be there. See if the committee I mean, wants to yeah. Yeah. put the list back. Well, I, 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 I didn't want this to list. Yeah, which one to what? Went through first in case we run out of time. Sure, anywhere. Absolutely, I think that's a good idea. Um, I am open to whatever the committee wants. Okay, so Steve is not here for the second half. I feel like the adult left the room. <laughs> um, so we have six PRAs to go through, and. Judy just suggested that we might want to go around. Do people have a preference of order? Like I was thinking both the giant flat weed and the um, there's a flora might be ones y'all want to put on top. Sure. Okay, <laughs> we'll just go with that then. So if there are, uh, can folks hear me? Grace, I see you. Can you hear me? Okay, great. <laughs> So based on Judy's suggestion, why don't we look at the knotweed, the fallopia sacalinensis. So I'm going to have to lean on prior experience and wisdom here. How did how did you all review these PRAs before? Um, the author usually uh, kind of went through the different items. Oh, Some faster um, than others. Wait, is there, this is, are we looking at these online or are we looking at these? You know what? I can pull it up on the big screen how's that yeah that would be good okay yes. and judy you signed yourself up first if that's the process because you're you apparently filled this pra out i know oh judy yeah lucky you thank you <laughs> yeah so like i think this was reviewed and originally authored by Judy in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think what we would have had in the former committee is that author would have revised this before we would have met, you know, mm -hmm. but so that's what's unclear. Okay. About how we proceed in the future too. It's like where we're authored it usually is the, is the representative. That makes a lot of sense. Actually, yep. No, it's okay. I can find my original URL. Okay, it's up on the screen, and I can also send it to you. No, isn't that a movie um, document? Yeah, I think I have the Word version. Yeah, you still left to us earlier. Yep. Yeah, the the Word versions were on March twenty fourth, twenty twenty three. That's where I should be looking. Thank you. Judy, I have a confession. This is Catherine. Um, when I was reviewing them, I did open this document and I made a couple of typo uh, adjustments. So that that will show as a more recent date on the SharePoint. Oh, yeah, what's, where's the SharePoint? So the SharePoint link is in the most recent email that came on uh, Tuesday of this week. At, and I can, yep, and I can put that in the chat if that would be helpful. Is that from Eric? From, from Emily? That was from Emily, and it has a link to the PRAs in it. You know, there's several other things with this one. One, I remember the committee had wanted me to put all the references um, not in the section where they pertain, but down at the bottom in the references cited. So, yeah. That. Um, I think actually what I, the most notable thing to remark about this is the committee just wanted it added to the not really complex. We already have a PRA for us. Uh, Bohemian, I think. Oh no, maybe not. We have one for the Japanese knotweed, and we were going to add Bohem the hybrid and the giant uh, to that. So I kind of feel like we already agree that knotweed should be added to this list, but we can review that, or you can just go to these notes. Um, yeah, I think we're just going to add these varieties. Yeah, to the. Like to the existing one, but I guess we needed their individual PRAs. So this is a 
I mean, I guess we should go through and determine, does this have enough information filled out in the PRA to be, you know, considered a, a full one to actually make a recommendation on? Or do we decide that this needs revision and updating and we can bring it to the next time? Right. Yeah, I think that's why it's. And I think since this is going to be the first one that we're looking at as a full committee, mm -hmm. that maybe we can also use this as an example for what may be lacking and make notes as, as we're going through it. It's like, I think we can still utilize this in the recommendation. However, since we're going through it with a fine tooth comb, then see what's lacking in it. And I think it's a great idea. Those. So where should we start the discussion? Like literally go through line by line or look at chunks of subsections? So maybe we could just yeah, go line by line almost. Um, Quick. So, and we, we kind of are discussing it, that this is a variety and maybe we should note that in the, in the PRA. And it's funny because this is called a Pest risk assessment, but yet it is titled Vermont Ex Invasive Exotic Plant Evaluation Worksheet. Mm -hmm. so, so we should title it. So pest risk assessment. Pest like <laughs> specify that. Okay. Um, and then note perhaps in the scientific name of species that this is a variety of a species that's already listed. I'm going to start making these changes yeah. while we're talking. Yeah. Um, and and perhaps like when that original plant species was listed, and you know, kind of capture the fact that this is a um, plant species that was already listed in 2008 or whenever it was. I don't know when it was originally listed. And then maybe the date it was uh, number four, the date it was originally made and then revised today. If that's you know what we're gonna do. And Judy, I don't know if you want to make these changes yeah, online so we can kind of see. Oh, whoops. Yes, I have to bring them. Oh, it seems I have to find the um, <coughs> SharePoint file. This is, yeah. Sorry, now I just made all these changes. So hang on, I'm just going to pull it. So you're working off of the one on Teams, right? Like the PR is I think it's the same. Is it, is it not? I think I'm pretty sure it does the one I just probably said. Yep. Share with folks. All right. So mm -hmm. the one in Teams doesn't have that table. Okay. So let's just add in. Darn it. Oh, there you are. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Revised today. And then we're going to have to have a conversation about the watch list at some point, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the current status when you developed this, it was on the watch list that was the informal watch list. I presume so, yes. Yep. yes. Actually, no, it's not. It's, it states that it's not on the watch list in, the, in our list. No, it's not. Okay. So no current status would be. Right. All right. Let me change that. Okay. I don't see it on the on our NIP listing. The class B classification. No, I'm not doing anything. Would be appropriate in my opinion so should we add the um bohemian the hybrid to 
you so where that number seven where it says description blah 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 please list any hybrids that should be considered for quarantine I think you should add um, mm -hmm. Yeah, the whole complex, all the species that make up that complex. Yeah, which I have. Okay, so why don't you just make a note and just yeah. you're going to add them. <clears throat> so here's a. Here's a funny thing. Here's a funny thing. Mm. Uh, Fallopia japonica. Uh, does not have a pest risk assessment. Oh, that is funny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, is it on the list? It's on the class. class. Yeah, it's class B. It's class B. Um, it's been present. Da, 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 da. But it's we don't have a pest risk assessment for the first one that we've located. Well, true. Yeah, yeah. where are the old ones? Yeah, like those could be in Tim's file somewhere. They could be. Um, I suggest we add that to the discussion of what we do. Or we could just like it's on the list so it's on the list. yeah it's already it's officially on the list however it made it on mm -hmm. i think it's already in rule that rule list so we don't need to worry about taking it off but i think your point is well taken we need to have a good system of making sure that we track all the pras and can account for them um and that definitely makes it, sense it may, you know maybe it could we could develop a pra present PRA for those that are not, that don't have any. I think we could assume that since it made it through rulemaking, it had a PRA because it has to meet the list that's mm -hmm. in statute or in the rule. Mm -hmm. So I can't imagine it would have gotten in there without one. So, I mean, I don't feel a burning need to have one, but we could also modify this to include all three species the, uh, in the knotweed complex. Oh, that's a good idea. And because most of this will pertain to all of them. Yeah. Stephanie? No, I was just going to, um, uh, I, I was just going to suggest resisting creating PRAs for things that are already in the, the noxious weed list, unless there's some significant benefit um, to it. It, it, and not, not a, a records keeping kind of benefit, but something else, because it's already, as mentioned already by others, it's already listed. So there's no, only if we were going to take it off. <laughs> <laughs> would we then have to have some kind of a assessment as to why we would take it off? But I think because it's already there, it's there. Um, but that I'm sorry, the I, the last comment about adding it to this that that seems fine if that's a, a simple measure. Thanks. Okay, so just add it to that, the complex. Right. Yeah. Well, we're not going to be able to vote on this anyway. Right now, too, so. we're just doing this as an exercise, right? No. Yes, it depends on them what the committee thinks. Um, so, and I don't, Judy, I don't know if you noted that Aaron's comment in the former ad hoc committee, um, Aaron Marcus, who is Fish and Wildlife, mm -hmm. estimates that 20 to 50 percent of the invasive knotweed in Vermont is this hybrid in Washington, Rutland, and Addison counties. Oh, wow. I did not know that. <laughs> I don't see have the comments in here. Um, that's because I'm looking at the former ad hoc and NIP listing where we were making notes on this. Okay. Is that just anecdotal, Kim? Well, I thought we were agreed to allow the NIP listing um, to be adopted from to this committee too, so we can refer to it. What is NIP oh. stand for? The, the non-native non invasive plant listing. I just, sorry, I just meant Aaron's observation. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> but let me, yes. so that's just anecdotal, his botanical observation. Yes. There's not, we don't have like a data source. Oh, that's true, that is not a data source. It's not, I, I trust, I trust Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> so Aaron said that it was, how much did he think was it? 20 to 50% of invasive knotweed in Vermont is this hybrid and Washington, Rutland, and Addison counties. I could just send you that. Okay. Statement. Yeah, I would not be surprised from that to you because when I was looking for a site for bioinformation, I discovered that because the 
Takalara Editori, the biocontrol for Japanese knot, we um, isn't as effective on the hybrid and the mm -hmm. giant. Mm -hmm. There's other insects. Sorry, okay, so the description, you probably heard the image. And it looks like it is, you would, would you consider this like this complex widely distributed throughout the state? Yes. Well, I was just going down to nine. I don't know where everybody else is. Current range. Current range, yeah. Yeah, maybe adding that statement into current range. Sure. I have a question about uh, 9A. Um, what is considered the wild? I don't be a lawyer. <laughs> um, oh, actually, I can just have a statement to this. I guess as opposed to cultivated or planted from nursery stock. I was just wondering if it might be like um, uninhabited or some other clearer definition. No, no, I don't um, um, I have some overall comments after looking through these documents too. Um, so um there's a sort of formatting inconsistency maybe we could try using a fillable pdf form to drop some of this stuff into um because the fonts and the spacing and the justification don't look very professional not on this one in particular but just in general they were very varied um uh and then one last comment uh i, I can't remember was the original date on this 20 it, was it 2017? Um, 20, I think. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> the source of this map that we're looking at is not dated. Um, and so I guess it doesn't feel like it might be representative of current distribution if we even have that data. Um, and then one last note is uh, I think that we need to double check that these links are still accurate before we submit anything on the final. All good thoughts. Yep. Are you taking note of it? I I agree with all that. Yeah. <laughs> I I feel kind of uncomfortable submitting them as they are. They just look so different and. Very so how about we change track here and just say we're going to go over these six as much as possible, and then create and we will create. Um, a standardized form where we can pull the information to make it look good. And then at the next meeting, we will have gone through it and then we can officially vote um, or make the recommendation. Does, does that timeline work for everybody, even though it's pushing it out by a couple months? Yeah. yeah. I think it's worth taking the time and we can focus on the content um, of each of these so to get our baseline on our decision making, and then that'll help us focus on which ones need to be submitted. Um, and, and, and if anybody needs any help with formatting or trying to come up with the form, um, I'm happy to, to assist with that. So I guess it's a, the card before the horse or the horse before the card. So we, I know that we wanted to, so this is many years of these kind of sitting around and not being listed. So yes, we can take time to redevelop the form and reformat the form. I, I get it that the formatting is all messed up, um, but how much time do we want to delay the process of get these getting on the list versus us creating better forms for the future? Do we have enough information in these six PRAs to use them as PRAs to make a recommendation? I think is the question. Right. Is it enough information to meet the PRA definition. Yeah, and I think that's what we're trying to figure out right now is if there's enough information in these that we're looking at. I know the <clears throat> the multi-flora rose is not finished, so it's incomplete. So that one I would definitely suggest um, tabling and maybe getting the new format for that and so on and so forth. But the ones that do have enough information, yes, we can fix the formatting easily, but not revise the forms and then relist these. So that's kind of what I'd like to put out to the committee is, do we just want to polish this a little bit to get it formatted correctly and then and still 
you know, be able to vote this forward for changes and um, exception, accepting that it be moved towards um, uh, be to be listed. Okay, so you're 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 suggesting that we vote on maybe five if there's enough information and we just know multi-floor rose doesn't have it completed so we're going to take that off the table for today but your preference would be to actually make a recommendation and go through the full process um opening uh, stephanie i see that you have your hand up yeah i just wanted to make sure that the committee understood the process for um getting these listed uh, i think steve dwinell mentioned this earlier uh that the agency has to go through formal rulemaking process um, and that rulemaking process will likely include um, changes to the existing rule in addition to the listing of species. Um, and so I just wanted to say that we probably have some time. Um, the rulemaking process can take six to eight months. <laughs> so um, so it's not it's it's going to take time, I guess, is what I wanted to, to stress with folks. Um, and the agency hasn't even begun at this point a review of the existing role to determine if we want to make changes to other things within the quarantine. Um, so just I wanted to share some information. Thanks. Wait, Steph, can I ask a clarifying question? So you're saying that if the committee voted on something today, the agency would still not move forward with a rulemaking project process until the rule is changed? The agency no, you, we can make a recommendation if you wanted to today, um, but I thinking that the rulemaking process, in addition to listing these species, will include changes to the rule. It won't, they, it won't be independent. And it highlights how we are, the, the lack of nimbleness that this process creates, um, because it does take six to eight months to get a, you know them on the list so that i mean i just think that's a really fair thing to point out that it is a long process and maybe a little bit problematic because of that yeah so there there's that most definitely <laughs> which is a different issue which is why we're thinking of looking at the rule um to to become more nimble potentially um but then the other thing is is if the committee makes a recommendation um and these are to um catherine's points and makes recommendation and these are the documents that we're using these will be the documents that will accompany these species through the formal rulemaking process as public records to be considered by the public so and and i and i have not looked at these documents but i, I just heard some concerns regarding formatting um professionalism um, i mean not professionalism that, that i'm not casting doubts on everyone's professionalism that's not what i meant um but whether or not the links work whether or not the data is up to date um, but these would be, as recommended, the final pieces that would then accompany that rulemaking process. So I just want folks to be aware of that as well. Just, this is Caitlin, just question on like the timing of that, Stephanie. So when we make a recommendation, from what I understand, we still have opportunities to edit this before submitting it to the rulemaking process. Is that correct? into the like what, what's the time when does this need to be final yeah are you are you saying that if we make the recommendation today steph that we are unable to edit and change the document that the votes are based off of that would be my assumption because it would be the recommendation is based on these documents like these are driving the recommendation so the documents need to be completed before the recommendation is made. Once the recommendation is made, then it goes, and I, maybe I'm wrong, maybe this is an open question that we need to solve, but um, once the recommendation is made, it's based on these documents, those documents go to the secretary who then makes a decision about whether or not um, they want to list these species. And then the these documents accompany the rulemaking process. But I don't think that they can change. I don't think we can make a recommendation to the secretary and then change this information, even if it's generally accurate, but like without reviewing the links or, you know, whether or not the um, maps are up to date. I Because this is the basis for those next steps. So I think this needs to be done now, unless this is sufficient or the all the documents are sufficient, don't need any changes. 
Yeah, totally. Uh, this is Toby. I, I, I get that these have sat a while and you know, it's, it'd be good to be moving on these, but I, I think we should take our time and get these right and make them look professional and submit them as we should and have a document we feel, we feel good about and they all look the same. And I don't know if that's the whole revision of this sheet, but something needs to be done so they look consistent and we feel comfortable. I mean, we haven't even really looked at all the content of these things for many years, so mm -hmm. I I get it, but I don't want to rush it either. I think we should, you know, it's going to get a lot of scrutiny. I think we should feel good about these. And I think that from looking at these in the first place, um, the, all the content seems to be about the same. So I don't think that overhauling the format um, is necessarily going to be a big deal uh, to copy and paste stuff. As long as we continue the way we've been and we keep highlighting the things that we need to quickly update, um, I, I just don't see that that's going to delay us significantly to, to get it right. Um, okay. Um, just to say, like, I mean, how, how do we want to you know, like if it has to go through the rulemaking process, um, you know, like we want to have a nice lump of, you know, a group of species that we're going to recommend that have to go through the process because we're not going to be, you know, it, it, wanting to open that up, um, you know, repeatedly, I guess. Well, we will, but it, it you know, it takes, it's a long timeline. So, you know, do we just want to have six, five or six that we add, or do we want to like, you know, have 10 or 12 or something. Um, I think if we had point. the capacity to do PRAs, that would be yeah. great. Um, but I think that's the limiting point here. So I have a, this is Judy, I have a question for Stephanie. Um, so I wondered if there's any way that the agency could go ahead with making the language changes in the rule um, ahead of the recommendations just to get that started because it took two to three years to get the hemlock woolly adelgid rule changed. That, that seems like a long wait for something that, you know, it, it would complicate this process, I believe, if we combined the language change in the rule with the recommendations. Plus it adds, you know, this, this, this whole process has been delayed for so long. So it's so the the changes to the language is wholly it's you know it's me it's it's judy it's emily it's ben it's potentially krista for as long as she's with us um so that that, that timeline of making the changes to the rule is dependent on us um and if we can pull it out at the same time with um these recommendations we can do it all together like there's no there's nothing limiting us except for um workload of course <laughs> um so so yeah we we can we can do it all at once and i would actually um I, I hear the interest in moving through rulemaking and amending uh to include these species on the list um and uh, this is to the point made earlier and i apologize i can't remember the gentleman's name um I, I think we should move forward with these six and i and i do believe that the agency is interested in being more proactive and getting through rules in a and more often than it currently does um seeing as how i think this one's from 2012 uh we're we're interested in in adding things and 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 improving rules and continuously improving our processes so uh, we would like to <laughs> um, go through rulemaking more frequently. So if these are the only six that we're recommending, I, we can do it. That's fine. Not a worry. And then if we got another six in another year, we'll do it again. Yeah. So uh, this is a, a I, I agree that it should be more professional if this is our last attempt that we should um, have our last revision to bring these to the table for um, approval, so yeah. Okay. It sounds, like, it sounds like we need to revise these before they're officially on the um, recommendation list. Okay. Thanks, Stephanie, for the clarification. Yeah, that's really helpful. Yeah, this is why I miss Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the question is then, what is our best use of time today, seeing that we are going to be going through these one at a time? Is that is that what we should do or should we have like designate individuals on a voluntary basis to actually check 
and go over each of these six and then bring it um, in a completed form at. Well, maybe we could finish. Sorry, it's Toby. Maybe we could finish on this one, kind of how we're stepping through it. Yep. And then you get an idea of what we should be tweaking and updating and and then maybe we can delegate. And also we need to talk about the format we want to have for this new updated form or whatever. OK, so this does that make sense to everybody? We're going to go through this one as an example, just highlighting the areas that we're going to cover, the areas that need to be checked and stuff. Um, and then we will figure out collectively designate the other five and um, then discuss the actual the formatting. Yeah, I think it makes sense to go through this and make the updates that can be made quickly. And then a second um, uh, revision is for the let's move, let's let's create a better PRA for the future. Is that is that what you're saying, Toby? Well, a better PRA for these five or six. Oh, what we're doing. oh so we're we're going to create a, a better PRA for these five as well. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so when you say create, no, it, you're just talking about the formatting and making it look there's like not recreating the work. Right. I I, I guess what I'm saying is the um, get a, a standard format that we can live with for for now. Mm -hmm. But I think we probably want to look at updating this thing in general in the future. But yeah. that's what I was talking about after we go through this. Uh, not lead one was to agree on a format for this version that we're going to have them all look the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. An interim. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That sounds good. So I think we're saying the same thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is Katie. Um, this works well because Judy's here, but it also seems worth reaching out to the original authors, to, mm -hmm. right? And say like where there's references cited. Like, do you know of any updated references that have come out since then? Like, mm -hmm. getting that in there. Uh, we can obviously look at that too, but you know, a, a number of these were by Aaron and they probably have uh, that, you know, more forefront in their brain. I think that's totally fair. Yeah. All right. And I just do want to bring attention to our time. Um, we have until noon today and um, we're leaving. We need to leave the last 15 minutes um, to, for public comment. Um, if anybody um, has any comments, um, if Bernie's still on. But um, OK, yeah, Jude. So getting back to our. Um, to the not read PRA, so I'm on nine um, B and C, and I'm wondering um, what the merit in listing, for example, nine C, the names and locations of public areas. Um, my revision would be to list representative names or a sample of names, but I'm not sure like this particular plant is so ubiquitous, this would be quite time consuming to have a comprehensive list. So are you thinking county level would be enough well, as a distribution? Right, county level, or maybe we can have um, like an if then statement, like if this is widely distributed list by county, you know, because there's some things we're going to look at that are only in one location that would make sense to know where it was mm -hmm. or few. So just a thought, like for this one, we can just keep going, but I'm not listing all the public land where this, these three species are found. Out of curiosity, where do committee members um, stand or what are your thoughts around distribution? How granular does the information need to be? It depends just on the stage of the infestation. I mean, this one, I don't know if we can name a county where we don't think this species exists, but that's really valuable information to yeah. know. Um, yeah, and I think we could just, you know, say statewide uh, or limited to northeast counties or, you know, I, I don't think we have to have, I don't know if we need a map necessarily or not. I mean, I can think of a few aquatic plants that we know occur in two or three lakes, and we would list those two or three lakes because mm -hmm. that's what yeah. we know, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. other than that. So we might also want to address whether we want a standard map, like do we use iNaturalist as our basis or do we, you know, in some cases you're not going to want that if it's, um, if it's a rare, if it's, um, you know, unique occurrence on private land. 
So I guess we can't really standardize maps. Yeah, I think it's hard for iNaturalist because those aren't typically embedded. Right. Um, well, they do have the research quality. Yeah, that's. Yeah. I mean, I think the the map should be really a, dish, uh, a map that's an agency map. Um, but of course, you know, this is if we had a full time person developing these PRAs. <laughs> so, um, you know, just getting to the point that um, public areas are listed if we know them, if it's easier to list. Meg's point, like if hydrilla is going to be found in Montpelier Lake or whatever, I, I want to know where it is. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's dependent upon that particular species. So for something like knotweed, yeah. where it is so widely spread, statewide would be an okay way to capture that distribution. Yeah. And just note that in the notes. Yep. And we'll have to figure out the mapping thing um, for consistency. And I mean, if it's statewide, a map is probably not super valuable versus it's a fully red. Yeah. Vermont. Versus if it is like it's in these two counties and this is, you know, kind of early detection information, then that's really valuable. But yeah. if it's statewide, I wouldn't care if there wasn't a map. I wouldn't either. Right. Great. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. And just uh, noting, Judy, where did you get that original map? No, I naturally. Oh, it is a natural. Yeah. Okay. So maybe you can just note it. I think I did say that it's an iNaturalist map on there. Oh, yes, on, on number D. Yeah. Yep. But I also think, you know, we, you're right. If it's statewide, and that form should reflect that, you know, if it's statewide, then leave blah, blah, blah blank. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think we can figure yeah. out a way to make that a little bit more uniform. Right. All right. We agree if it's statewide, we don't need a map. Great. Okay. Does the population appear to be stable, expanding, or decreasing? Um, yeah, particularly for the, the hybrid and the giant, I think they're expanding. So is that based on observation or when we have some hands up? Go botany okay. native plant. Grace has got her hand up. Um, Stephanie. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, uh, Grace. Yeah, that's okay. Um, I was just thinking about the distribution question, and I was looking at Art Gilman. You're probably familiar with Art Gilman's flora of the state, and it might be a useful thing to compare to um, because he lists all the counties and towns where each species has been seen. And I just, I just noticed with the um, this fallopia species, he had some towns listed that we, that we didn't have here. And um, his language might be a nice thing to to reference because he says specimens seen from all counties um, if it's something that's, you know, statewide. So it might be a useful if we want to have like a standard way of um, listing the locations he's done. You know, he's looked at all the specimens from the herb area of these species. Can you send ever. me that reference? That would be great. Yeah, sure. There's a PDF online that you might, it might. Um... Yeah, Grace, if you're able to find it and then just drop it into the chat so that all of us can access that, that would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, unfortunately, you have to buy it online to access the PDF. Yeah. But let me just write, I'll just write the reference in there. Thank you. Okay. Keep going. And, and I was just gonna on the heels of that, like if we're gonna say statewide, we should define what we mean by that. And and maybe you said this already, and I apologize. Um, but it and Grace did allude to it that it's found in every county in the state would potentially be a way of defining um, what statewide means. Thank you. Okay. Moving right along. <laughs> Where are we up to? So we're at Everybody just yell out or raise your hand if you want to stop and talk about something. Um, do we know if, if it's being sold? Hopefully not, but we would all have a cow if we saw it in a <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I feel like we would know. We have not run into it yet. <laughs> Um, something to add to this PRA list, if we're taking notes on that. Mm -hmm. um, 
is it available online? Yeah. It says via mail order or online catalogs. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know, maybe to make that a little more present. Okay. I've met so many people who order plants through Etsy. Yeah. I did not know that was a thing. Yeah. No. Yeah. 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 Okay. Right. Well, remember the unsolicited oh. seeds? That was Etsy, Amazon. Oh. Hmm. Um, all right, we can definitely add that. Um, it's pretty good. Just in range areas. Well, so I'm, I'm as Ben, uh, it's a bag. Um, I, I just a quick Google search. If you type in giant knotweed and then shopping tab on Google, you get a lot of different um, medicinal products that are made from it um, that are sold in dried form, which, you know, aren't really a concern a risk form, but that is, um, I guess, something to consider in some way. Yeah, I think we only need to put it in here if it's a pathway. Yeah, yeah, if it's sold as a live plant, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I have a question about number 11. Um, like they did when they say intensely managed area. Oh, okay, the list is of intensely managed areas. Got it. Does anybody see anything missing on these lists? Seem pretty comprehensive. This is Mary Beth. I was looking at number eleven and wondering what the difference was between a roadside and a ditch. I know. Well. Ditch is part of a roadside. <laughs> I think I'd, I'd mark the ditch in addition to the roadside. So done. Yeah, ditch. We don't have, uh, well, I guess it's not intensely managed areas. We don't have forest, but that's never mind. We that's do the next one. Be, yep. Why that's not? Am I not in the right form that it's not changing? What do you want to add in ditch? There you go. Yeah, no, I'm trying to add ditch. It finally worked. Or agricultural ditch. <laughs> a ditch, a ditch to me. Well, is it, an agricultural can... ditch. <laughs> <laughs> and are your yellow supposed to be the check? Yeah. I mean, you could say a lot of these things. I'm just looking at this. Just moving gravel around is still the way that stuff gets around. The sewer subject. Okay, I can finish filling this out later. Okay. Do we have gravel? Is it a gravel yeah. pit? We get stuff in storm water. So it's can transport by tractor or equipment fragments when you move it. Yep. You can fill. Yeah, I can I can just review that. I'm gonna make myself a note. It's like floor plan four should be added. I mean it should be everything. I'm right. just going to fix it. So, you want, you, so the floodplain forest, do you think that should be separate from forest woodland? It is. Oh, we, oh is it? it is. Oh, it is already there. I was just, it wasn't checked. Oh, there it is. Got it. It wasn't highlighted. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, well, you know what? I mean, I'm going to. All right, we're going to just keep going. Everything except the ponds. <laughs> Something really funky happened here with this. And potential impacts. Okay, we've got ten minutes to get through this. This is this is. Uh, it, I don't know if we're going to get through it. Well, we could. What portion of what we said we wanted to get done today can be done after? And follow up. I think I can. What I can do is I can try to create an initial draft format. And then send it around so that we can do some of that online just as a live document um, because it's going to be based off of this just cleaning it up and we can work on that so we don't need to do that um we i guess we could also delegate the five um somehow online too um what do you think kim is it better to have people raise their hands and have people accountable at this juncture or it seems like we should because, you know, I did put out to the entire group and others. Hey, does anybody want to look these over? And nobody got back to me. So yep. I think it has to be, you know, hands because otherwise nobody's going to do it. Okay. 
might be good to have like a sign up sheet so it's like you have a minimum of at least three people working on a PRA and mm -hmm. you know I, I could envision just holding an hour long virtual meeting where three people just get into the mm -hmm. details of that specific PRA and then they bring it back and present it to the team but we should have our eyes on all of it if we're recommending anything mm -hmm. as a full group mm -hmm. yeah I like that and then yeah. you have more perspectives and expertise and experience feeding into each PRA. Yeah, I like that. I think basically what we're doing now should be done in an ad hoc committee, and then we bring the final to the to this committee and yep. do this again with the full committee. Yep. So it's polished. I think that may, that I I definitely appreciate that. Right, and three people is under the open meeting law about. Meetings, so without hearings, so does, but if you're an ad hoc committee, does that count? Like an ad hoc committee is a working group of this committee. Is this committee the only committee that needs to be warned for meetings? Stephanie, I think your ad hoc committees need to be warned. I'm sorry, but I'll look into it more, and we can maybe maybe we'll follow up. Um, Emily will follow up with the directions and we'll figure out that at we'll answer the ad hoc question. Because mm -hmm. um, I, th I think subcommittees of state committees still need to comply with the open meeting law. So sorry about that. Um, and then the other piece I wanted to mention um, as we go through these five, I guess, not six, because one's incomplete. Um, maybe we can create an, an additional ad hoc committee to revise the form. So I just wanted to throw that on the table as well. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what we already said. Yeah. Oh, you did say that. Okay. I was just thinking like, but that ad hoc committee for the forum wouldn't necessarily have to participate in the other ones, but whatever. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Steph. All right. So we're not going to go through the actual details, right? We're kind of looking at just the, we're not making a recommendation today. So. Right. Do you want to get into the actual meat of the okay. content of summarize specific details about plant qualities? Do we want to go through all of that yeah, in detail? Should we instead just assign ourselves to committees? I think that might be the best use of our time, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, OK with that. How about any any? Is anybody opposed to that approach? What we're going to do is we're just going to identify the uh, groups who will be focusing on each one. OK, let's do that. And I apologize for this kind of being all over the place. Just going to be fine, a bit. Yeah, we're figuring this out together. Well, um, you know, I think like it's a new group. Yeah, we had a several year interruption. I think we did pretty well. We're covering a lot of ground. We're coming up with the ground rules and figuring out how we're going to work in this new mode. I think this is all stuff we have to do. So everybody feels good. I feel like this has been a productive meeting. OK, so why don't we go through each each of the six as they are and. If you're interested in it, raise your hand, I guess. And what is our target? What what is what what are we aiming for? Two or three people per um species to create their own little group to review this yeah does that work sounds like or three people yeah three people and emily who who is missing do do we so lynn mcnamara definitely wants to participate but these meetings happen to fall on other important meeting days so there's uh, Lynn, um, there's going to be an FPR person. There will also be a VNLA representative. Um, and let's see, that might be. So I'm just wondering if we could keep them in the mix. And and, and Mike, Mike is, is Mike on there? No, so Mike Bald also is not on here, but he's on the committee. So those are four people. Um, who gets to be on these committees? The author and committee members? Because I'm not a committee member. The author, I think, is important. Yeah, I mean, yes. Who wants to do the knotweed with Judy? 
And he take okay, so Katie, thank you, Katie. That's Katie. <laughs> um, Katie and Judy. Um, I'm not an expert in that weed, but it is super relevant to riparian areas. So it's the closest one of the six listed that I would participate in. So I'll volunteer for that one. Fantastic. Thank you. All right, the knotweed complex is taken care of. <laughs> wow, great. Um, you join. <laughs> we got four other or five, five others. Yeah, we do. Yeah. There was a question. I had a question that this told me. Um, the email you sent way back in March or whatever had five species listed. But the agenda had six, six, and I think I missed the multi-floor rows on one of those because it isn't completed. So I, I was under, I, I only listed the five that were completed. I think. Got it. I had five with multi-flora. Yeah. So it's Alnus, Galnus, yes. Yeah, so so it also wasn't on the march. Okay, so that one is, it is right here. Sorry, I did, if I did, if it wasn't included in that. But that is so. Let's do that one. Allness Lutenosa. <laughs> All their, I mean, a big size. You have great toobies, I hear. It's always been dealing with that dark species for years. I'm happy. I don't have much experience with it, but I'm happy to. Uh, well, help wrote that one. Yeah, I, Bob popped it. Bob popped it. Yeah, I'm willing to work on that one too. Yes. <laughs> yep. Is Bob reachable? I guess he's still. Yeah. He know. said he wanted to join yeah, as, a, as, as a public person. And I do know he was in, included in the, that email that you sent out. So, I yeah. So I could email him that way. And, yeah. and don't forget, Steve uh, Mortillo was um, treating that currently, too. So he might be another option. He's, I know he's left the chat. The oh, chat. Yeah. But... Good point. And he said he has, it's possible, Please extra people. Yeah. Um, because I'm also willing to work on the other woody ones. I, the herbaceous stuff, I just don't have the experience with. So, okay. Um, who so was so? Who was going to do all this? So, you, I'm open to it. Okay, Toby, have Caitlin, Caitlin, Bob, and somebody else. Then maybe not. I like I said, I'm willing to work on any of the woody ones. So, okay. Because we have experience with all of those. So, okay. So we volunteered, Steve. Bonnie's got her hand up. Bonnie. Okay, I was going to volunteer to do it, but I also am pretty good at formatting things. So I can wait until that. <laughs> Thank that you. Part. Okay. That, that would be very helpful. Great. All right. So, right now for all this glutenosa, I have Toby, Caitlin, and Bob. And I, I mean, we, that's three people. Bonnie, you want to? Try for another one so we get yeah. more populated. That sounds good. And if you are you gonna do a group of people formatting the form? Because I could just wait for that. Yeah, yes. I'm happy to help you with that, Bonnie. Okay, that's good. You know, we just found the formatting team. Bonnie okay. and Catherine. And I'll I'll be on that okay. team too. And Kim, got it. Okay. Um Toby, what did you sign yourself up for? Any woody, woody plants, but was that the almost you one? Sorry, I'm slow on my notes. Yeah. Notice that I left many people off. Yeah, I was just saying okay. any of those woody ones I'm okay. open to doing. I don't know if I want to do all three, but right. I could do three. Who else volunteered with you for all Um, Caitlin. Oh, okay. Caitlin, Toby, and Bob. <laughs> yep. Unbeknownst <laughs> to him. But maybe Steve. Sort of a sign, Steve. Maybe Steve. Steve. Yep. Maybe Steve would have, because that's one of yeah. the worst spots. All right, that's, sure. yeah. On state. And that's Steve Mortillo. Mortillo, yep. Okay, Autumn Olive. Okay. <laughs> so I see in the old notes, um, that's supposed to be a change to B to A. Mm. Autumn Olive 2A is the recommendation? Yeah. I thought that was federal. Change to B to The recommendation a. of which part of... Um, One is A is not sold. Oh. B is already here and sold, right? I thought A was federal species, so not right. That's what I thought, too. 
Well, but I don't know if that's how it's just. Let's look at the sure. Whoever's looking at that species should look at both species of Angustifolia and Umbelina. Are you seeing that in nurseries? No. Um, no, not. Not Otomolo. There is something. Frangulophile. Same, same genus, but. All our class A's are um, aquatic. Yeah, just something to note whether, because we had uh, that note in the former. Right. Okay, so we have Ben. Um, anybody else for Ottomolan? Olive? I can help if you want. This is Amy. Or assign me anywhere. I don't care. Okay, we've got three. So for Ottomolan, we have Ben, Toby, and. And I don't, the author, I don't know that she's still at TNC. Okay. Maybe Lynn would be yeah. interested in helping on that one. Okay, so I'm going to put Lynn as a question mark. All right, what's the next one? Multiflora rose. <laughs> you know, though it's not at all aquatic. <laughs> yeah, it's not really. <laughs> I'll take that just for because it's not been developed, and I think it might be helpful for me to walk through that process with new members. Okay. Don't take on too much, though. I know, I'm just doing two. Thanks, Judy. Sorry. Anybody else? Any any other volunteers for Multiflora Rose? I mean, I, I'll, I'll help too, but maybe if we get others. I think, no, I think we should stay away from like, uh, like I'm worried about you piling on too much. But it just doesn't seem fair. Just put me as a placeholder, because I okay. suspect that we'll have other people that aren't here, maybe interested in helping on one of the others too. So I'm permit me to two, but put me down for three. How about that? Okay. <laughs> so since, I'm really like, oh, yeah. all since I'm not an official member of the committee and I'm only temporary, do you think I should be involved? Totally. Okay. Totally. Okay. That would be great. For, okay. Right. Krista, as long as you're around, cool. yes, you are really valuable. So okay. also just bring up multiflora rose wasn't even on the watch list. Um, I'm just throwing out like a question. I'm surprised it wasn't on the original list. Yeah, it's not though. It's not even on the list. So, just it's on the Vermont Invasives website, which is not the same thing as the. So the watch list, watch list. Watch right. list. It's a little confusing. Yeah. yeah. So that'll be just interesting to see. Is the watch list an agency? It is not. There is no regulatory weight on these, so that's going to be another discussion I point. Said there was, but I don't know what. There's nothing. I don't yeah. think. So I think the watch. So in the former committee, um, we basically anything that was on the watch list we we're watching out for, and then those were moved to the noxious weed lists. So so that's a way to triage and prioritize. Right. Okay. Okay, so at the next meeting, that'll be something we dig into. Yeah, but um, I think we should, a, a, a PRA should be developed for, for that. <clears throat> All right, pedicides. Of round of disinterest. <laughs> I, I would, even though Judy told me not to do too much, <laughs> I'll be like Toby, like I'll put, I'll, I can be the guiding person, but if anybody else wants to jump on that, because Aaron really moved that one forward and is the original author. Aaron Marcus. Aaron. Is Aaron so what is Aaron's status right now? Are they work um, in? I don't know. Grace, you have a, your hand up. Maybe you can ans answer that question. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I, was, yes. I am happy to work on that as well um but aaron's the assistant botanist for the department right now oh there you go so, so maybe so we'll work closely. i'm gonna put aaron down with the hope that they will <clears throat> agree to continue working on this is that appropriate um yeah i'm happy to check in with them as well okay that it. would be great yeah sure Okay, so for pedicides, we have Kim, Grace, and hopefully Aaron. All right, last one. 
Vicaria Verna. I'll sign myself up for that one. I don't know much about it at all. Yeah, can we remind me what it is and it's called? Lesser Calend uh, Figs oh, Crow Foot. Calendine. Um, Renatulus. I can also volunteer for that one. Okay. And that was another one that wasn't on the watch list. Our stuff. Okay. Judy, I'm signing you up there. Okay, you're we're doing vicaria. Okay, we're good. Ah. <laughs> uh, oh, it is on it was on the watch list. Sorry about that. Okay. So can I just go over quickly about what I have so everybody knows what they're signed up for? Formatting. Bonnie, Catherine, Kim, and myself. For the knotweed complex, Judy. Katie and Meg, the Allness Glutinosa, Toby, Caitlin, Bob, and possibly Steve. Autumn Olive, we have Ben, Toby, Ann, and maybe Lynn. For Multiflora Rose, Kim, maybe Toby, Krista, those three. For Pedicides, Kim, Grace, and Aaron. And for Ficaria, Verna, Emily, Krista, and Judy. Everybody in agreement with that? So I guess the, the question will be, um, we'll have to figure out how those groups are going to meet. Um, Whether it's open. Yeah. So how about this? Once Stephanie and I figure out what the details are around the the rules around make it, you know, warnings and things like that, we'll send an email out just letting you know, yes, these need to be warned or no, you're fine. Just go ahead and meet on your own time and figure that out. Um, but I do think that that clarification is important. Yeah, I thought Steve had said the last meeting that that the committee after this was on its own. That is. And yep. that would be doing the research. So that's how I'm seeing that, but I guess you guys can figure it out. Because <laughs> this committee is just to make recommendations. Yep. Not research. Right. So I guess it depends on how we classify that. Okay. Yep. So we'll let we'll let you all know if uh, needs to be warned. Um, OK. How about approximate timeline of this? Yeah, that's a good one. Summer. <laughs> we, we decided when this is going When is the next summer? meeting? Let's decide. And actually, um, once we do that, there is no member of the public on, I don't think. Bernie's oh, Bernie's there. So, OK, so we want to make sure that Bernie has an opportunity to comment um, if he's interesting. Let's just go ahead and decide our um, next meeting date. Um, we're doing it quarterly, so it'll be three months. Oh, jeez. Oh, September. September. Okay, September. Not so bad. Late September? Is it September? It is September. Late. Okay, that's things will make well not quite slowing down, maybe for a lot of people. Okay. So I did have one. Uh, it is Lynn McNamara should be able to come to the September one. She doesn't have any conflicts in that one. So which one would work for folks? The 28th or the 21st? Any preferences here? 21st does not work for me. Okay. Me neither. Okay. The 28th, would that work for folks to put that in our calendars? This is Mary Beth, and I'm retiring on the 29th, and I can't guarantee that I won't be completely swamped. Wow. Things up. <laughs> well, if you're interested in continuing on afterwards, uh, leave us your, your personal email, and we can certainly keep you on. I'm going to decline, but thank you for that. Thought. All right. <laughs> Okay, so all right, we will figure out uh, another replacement for 
your spot once you're gone, Mary Beth. But thank you so much for all your work then. Um, if you're not going to be attending another one, I know that you've been a fixture um, in this round for a long time. So thank you so much. You're and welcome. congratulations. When we finally get a, a retirement party plan in place, you know, the committee will get an invitation. <laughs> great, great, great. Okay, so the 28th, we're going to proceed with the 9 a.m. to 12. Um, the question is where? Be okay with this being a central spot and then for folks who can't make it here, just the virtual option, just having those two. Does that work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I will send an official invite out, but the 20 September 28th from nine to noon will be the BIPAC meeting. And then maybe in the afternoon, we'll have that just cross agency organizational um, conversation um, opportunity. Yeah, Katie. Quick PSA, um, the email address that was me on this agenda and everything was not me. Oh, um, OK. And Kim, whatever email you sent last week, I did not receive. So if you're replying all on that, um, I'm not on there. OK, <laughs> we will fix that. Thank you. What is your correct email? It's Catherine underscore Kane at FWS.gov. I didn't use your the other one went to Kate so. Kane. K-A-I-N. OK, so that wraps up for our actual work. Um, we do are required, this is a public meeting, to give an opportunity to for members of the public to um, have an opportunity to speak. And is there anybody online who would like to take that opportunity? Sure, this is Bernie, can you hear me? We can hear you, Bernie, thank you. So uh, Bernie Paquette uh, in Jericho, Vermont, uh, appreciate the focus on structure and process. Uh, you guys are taking on a, a load of work and uh, I really uh, applaud the methodology that you're taking. Uh, I think somewhere along the mission statement, I may be incorrect, but I thought I saw something about success stories, uh, methodologies, that kind of work. Uh, if that is part of your venue, uh, uh, I know that you have a lot in front of that to do, but eventually if you get to that, uh, if, again, if that's part of your venue, uh, I, I applaud that piece of it as far as the connection with uh, conservation committees and the public in general. Uh, three, I had a comment about the mapping that you talked about. Uh, uh, just a suggestion of possible consideration. Uh, if you do go with agency determinations um, to maybe consider uh, both agency determination of, of where things are located, you know, the agencies determined that to be the case, as well as a feed for my naturalists and maybe just a separate symbol so you could see like dots and triangles or something, just, just a, a, a something to consider. Uh, four, um, it, it, this may be outside your venue, but when there is a new uh, plant or species, a plant specifically listed as an incredible invasive, um, is there a direct communication to nurseries? I assume yes, but also is there a way to for the, the state connects to people that uh, sell online? Because I noticed that some of these companies have uh, notations that say, except for these states. So that was the question. That, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bernie. And I think Judy has an answer or comment about that. Um, in terms of online sales, that becomes a federal issue because it's crossing state lines usually. And so we've been informed that we need to um, provide those companies with our uh, not just weed lists, and they will try to incorporate that into their um, database programming so that they do not sell to those states. Some companies are more accessible uh, or make that more easy to do than others. That's been a national plan board issue. Thanks. Thank you, Judy. And, yeah. and I think your point about just um, communicating with outreach to nurseries, that is something if something were to be added that would be incorporated into our nursery inspection um, activities um, and we would be sharing that new list and just highlighting the ones that were added um, if they're of concern of being um, moved in the nursery trade. Great, thank you for your time folks. Yeah, thank you Bernie. We presumably do outreach for the rulemaking too. Yes, we absolutely would. Okay, wow. <laughs> Wow. Anything else? 
did we do we want to set a timeline on when oh the pras okay pra for the meeting and uh, i think they definitely our goal i think we are going to want to make a recommendation or vote on the recommendations next time so by next meeting we should have that formatted um, pra that will, you know all the information will need to be migrated but I think that would probably be the goal. Um, uh, I don't know what is realistic. Do you do you actually think these can be done as a group with just a couple sittings? I just don't know people's availabilities and times with September. Is it something that is reasonable to aim for? Just having it completed. Um, I think it's good to by, aim for. Aim for yeah. Whatever we get, I'm just forward. Yeah. Yes. And we, you know, you guys agreed that um, you thought maybe um, multi floor rows and um, and the giant knot who might be ones that we want to push more or have as priority. If you still feel that way, those could be the ones that we try to emphasize. Those ad hoc committees step on the gas more. Yeah, and an email. I could send out an email with a proposed timeline. I'm just thinking, like right now, it kind of is dependent on whether these meetings need to be warned, um, because that's going to add in some um, planning hurdles for folks. So um, once we get clarity on that, maybe I'll propose certain timelines, and everybody can have feedback into what they think about that. Should the committees, even though they haven't formed yet, but could some member of the committee try to get in touch with the original author if that's appropriate? Or do we think we should just move forward with or without them? Or the institution. Right. It's Aaron, Bob, and then um, the intern from TNC. So, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I don't see why not. Yeah, somebody needs to volunteer. <clears throat> okay, anything else? Oh, multi floor rows was is on the watch list. It's it was just backwards in the email, so it's Rosa multi multi flora. Gotcha. If the common name is multi flora rows, that's really fun. Okay. okay. Well, thank you all for your time. Um, and Adrian has a oh, Kathy's on there. Or Kathy. Yeah, it was Sorry, Kathy. Um, that's okay. I, I just was going to say that uh, I don't want to speak for Bonnie and Kim, but I think it might be reasonable for us to get together for a quick chat uh, to talk about tactics on the format. Um, maybe we can look to the schedule for next week and that way we could try to commit to maybe some sort of uh, template for you guys to review um, by mid-July or at least to start like working with. Um, that way we're we're doing both um, efforts concurrently and by next meeting we can hopefully have something to submit. Yeah, I think that's good. I think it's we need to figure out if that committee needs to be warned as well for the public. Um, so if that's the case, next week is going to be a little early, but we can certainly, you know, I think it's a does anybody know what the public meeting like warning is? Does it have to be in advance? I thought it said 48 hours. 48 hours in our guide and document. Okay, so that actually. I mean, it's a state law. Yeah. Well, this is a state meeting. Well, okay. uh, it, I mean, I wonder, does it have to be a public meeting if we're just talking about a form? I mean, there's no data in it. There's nothing. There's no decisions being made. Well, I don't know. Stephanie, what do you think on this? Yeah, I, I, I think on the form, because it's not really the business of the board or the committee, I, I that's like housekeeping. I don't I don't think you need to warn that. OK, that makes it easier. I yep. love your timeline, Catherine. Sounds good. I don't. <laughs> hey, uh, if it doesn't, uh, Kim, you have already signed up on multiple things, so I mean, you want to partake, though. Oh, what is your time frame? Oh, uh, your summer looking like yeah. with all your. No, it's just insane. So um, I can I can meet you guys next week if you want to throw something up on my calendar if you can see it. Oh, you can't see. It. I'll try to set something up with the four of us. I'll overlay our calendars. Okay. Anything else? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday work better for me. Yeah.